vision is undoubtedly one of the most important senses you have. Without it, flying an aircraft would be impossible. Vision allows you to see what your airplane is doing and what is happening around you. Even an instrument rated pilot flying without outside visual references must rely heavily on the visual sense to interpret the instruments and determine how the aircraft is performing. The eyes serve as your visual sensors. Almost everything you perceive about the world around you is based on vision. In good weather, for example, you know that your aircraft is flying straight and level because this is the image which was produced in previous training sessions. When you see another airplane, it is your visual sense that tells your brain where it is and what it's doing. Your reaction is based on the processing of this visual information. There are times, however, when the brain has trouble interpreting what the eye is seeing. For example, do you see a candelabra in this picture? Or two people facing each other? Are the long lines parallel? What do you think now? Is line A or B longer? This program will explain the structure of the eye along with its limitations, especially those that occur at night. It will also tell you how to compensate for certain illusions that are created during flight. Light reflected or emitted from an object projects an image through the iris and lens of the eye. This light is bent or refracted so that the image is focused on the retina. The retina is made up of very tiny photosensitive cells called rods and cones. The cones are concentrated in the central part of the retina and provide the sharpest image. As the level of illumination decreases, the cones in the central area of vision begin to lose their ability to see clearly. The rods are located primarily in the peripheral area of the retina and are responsible for your peripheral vision. To test your peripheral vision, look at something straight ahead of you. Then, with your arms out to the side of your body, slowly move them forward until you can barely see your hands. At this point, you cannot see the fingers on your hand. This is because the rods cannot distinguish very well. If you turn and look directly at one hand, you see a lot of detail because the cones are now being used. Although rods can't see detail well, they are very sensitive to low light. But it takes time for them to adapt. This fact can be observed when you turn out the lights at night. At first, it's pitch black. Then gradually you begin to see more detail. What you are experiencing is the rods adapting to the available light. 30 minutes generally is required for the eyes to fully adapt. Careless or inadvertent exposure to bright light after your eyes have adapted to the darkness will temporarily impair night vision. The amount of impairment depends on the intensity and duration of the exposure. If the light is bright enough, it could take a full 30 minutes for your eyes to readapt. If it looks like you will be exposed to a bright light and you have time to react, Closing one eye will retain the light sensitivity in the closed eye. This allows you to see once the light has disappeared. At night, you need to be able to read the instruments, notes, and maps, and still be able to look out at a black sky and scan for other aircraft. Red cockpit lighting helps maintain your dark adaptation. As with all lights used at night, they should be set as low as possible while still enabling you to see the instruments. Red light, however, impairs your ability to see certain colors. For example, the colored ranges on the instruments, notes written in red, or the magenta colors on the sectional chart are very hard to read. Use of a carefully directed dim white light should be used whenever appropriate. To help you see other aircraft at night, federal regulations specify that all aircraft must be equipped with position lights they must be on any time the aircraft is operating between sunset and sunrise. The required position lights are a red light on the left wing tip, a green light on the right wing tip, and a white light on the tail. Each light is shielded so it can be seen only from a specific angle. 
By understanding where the position lights are located, you can determine an aircraft's direction of flight. For example, since you can only see the anti-collision light and the white light on the tail of this aircraft, it is moving in the same direction as you are. This aircraft is approaching head-on because both of the wingtip lights are visible. This one is moving right to left since you can only see the red light on the left wingtip. Scanning the sky at night requires a slight modification to the normal scanning technique because the rods located in the periphery of the retina are more sensitive to light than the cones. During periods of low illumination, a blind spot can develop in the central vision area where a large concentration of cones exists. However, by looking to one side of an object, the rods are exposed to the light and the object becomes more visible. When flying at night, you must be careful to avoid visual illusions which could place you in a dangerous situation. One of these illusions is caused by staring at a single light source, such as a star, against a dark background which is void of any other visual cue. If you stare at it long enough, the light may suddenly appear to move. This is known as the autokinetic phenomenon. If you are not aware of this problem, you might think the light is another aircraft and make abrupt control movements in order to miss it. This could result in an unusual attitude or at the least could be very unnerving to any passengers you might have with you. Keeping your eyes moving will eliminate this problem. You should also be aware that the lights you see at night can produce illusions. For example, bright lights appear closer than dim lights. So bright runway lights might make you feel you are closer to the runway than you actually are. This could cause you to begin your descent earlier than you should, creating a dangerously low approach. The opposite illusion could occur if the runway lights are viewed through fog, haze, smoke, or a dirty windshield. Since the lights are less bright, you might delay starting your approach. This could cause you to overshoot the runway. Runway width can also produce a false visual perspective. Suppose this is the night view of a typical three-degree approach to the runway you normally land on. Now, suppose you're flying into an unfamiliar airport and you see the outline of this runway. Are you on the correct approach angle? Above it or below it? Actually, you would be on the correct approach angle. The difference is that the runway you are familiar with is 150 feet wide, while the unfamiliar runway is only 75 feet wide. Visual illusions are not limited to night flight. Landing illusions occur in daylight as well. The slope of the runway can also give you false visual cues, especially during the approach. For example, here is the visual image created during an approach to a normal flat runway. The side view shows the correct approach angle to the runway. When the slope of the runway changes, the visual image changes as well. Here is the correct approach angle to a down-sloped runway. It creates the illusion that you're low. If the approach is flown from a position that makes the runway appear to look normal, your approach angle would be too steep. This situation may produce excessive speed on final approach, an abrupt flare, and a long float before touchdown. The possibility of making a bad landing or of overshooting the runway would be increased. On the other hand, the normal approach angle to an upsloped runway would look like this. It creates the illusion of being too high. Again, if you try to make the image of the runway appear normal, your approach would be dangerously low. The best way to avoid being fooled by a sloping runway is to use approach lighting aids, such as VASI or PAPI, to assist you in flying the correct approach angle. In addition, before landing at any new airport, check the airport facility directory for runway information. This will include the length, width, and if appropriate, the slope of the runway. Checking the contour lines on a sectional chart will also give you an idea about the slope of the surrounding terrain. Closely spaced contour lines indicate steeper terrain. As a pilot, you need your vision to comprehend what is happening around you. But even with perfect sight, 
problems can still occur. You must understand the limitations of the eye and the illusions that occur and take the necessary precautions to ensure a safe and enjoyable flight. When outside references are hidden or obscured by darkness or low visibility, your brain may have trouble comprehending what is actually happening. The confusion that results from the conflict between what you see and what you feel is called spatial disorientation. The best way to overcome the effects of spatial disorientation is to rely on the flight instruments and believe in what they are telling you. But it's not always easy to do because certain situations produce more conflicting information than others. For example, here is what appears to be the horizon. But a check of the attitude indicator shows that the aircraft is in a bank. The horizon is actually here. As the wings are leveled, you can see how spatial disorientation can be caused by misinterpreting lights on the ground and stars in the sky. Spatial disorientation is not limited to flying at night. It can occur in clear skies when you are flying above a cloud deck. If you maintain a level attitude solely by reference to the cloud tops, you could actually be in a banked attitude. You can see that it's important for you to combine outside visual references with a check of your airplane's attitude instruments. When you fly, you rely heavily on your sight for orientation and balance, but you are continuously receiving input from other senses that can either confirm or conflict with what you see. One of these senses is called the kinesthetic sense. When pressure is applied to your skin, joints, and muscles, nerve impulses provide your brain with a sense of your body's position. A problem with the kinesthetic sense is that your brain has trouble telling the difference between pressures associated with gravity and those created by maneuvering G-loads. Another sense that helps you maintain balance and orientation is the vestibular sense. As you maneuver an airplane, the vestibular organs in your inner ear sense the movement. Your inner ear contains three semicircular canals that are roughly aligned with the three axes of the airplane. The canal located along the vertical plane senses pitching movements. The canal located along the horizontal plane senses yawing movements. The canal located along the lateral plane senses rolling movements. The three semicircular canals are filled with a gel-like fluid that is able to move within each canal. At the base of each canal are small hairs that project into this fluid. When you move your head or maneuver your airplane, the fluid inside the canal is set in motion. This movement causes the sensory hairs to bend. This sends a nerve impulse to your brain, where it is interpreted as movement in a specific direction. When the hairs are not bent, movement is not detected. This can happen when you're at rest or when the fluid stabilizes. For example, after being in a prolonged shallow turn, the fluid in your inner ear catches up to the rest of the ear and the sensory hairs stop bending. This creates the sensation that you have stopped turning. Any change in bank will again set the sensory hairs in motion and further distort your perceived position from your actual flight attitude. This illusion can easily be avoided by frequently cross-checking your airplane's attitude instruments and believing what they tell you. Another type of illusion that can occur during a prolonged constant rate turn is the Coriolis illusion. This illusion can be caused by rapidly tilting your head to change fuel tanks or to pick up an object. This movement starts the sensory hairs in the semicircular canals in motion and can create a false sensation of turning or accelerating. You can avoid Coriolis illusion by using slow, deliberate head movements. Although every pilot is subject to disorientation, it is more likely to occur when you are flying at night or in marginal weather without relying on your flight instruments. By understanding the limitations of your senses and relying on your instruments, 
you can help to prevent the potential problems caused by spatial disorientation. Breathing. It's such a natural process that we rarely think of it at all. The respiration process is one of your body's most complex functions. Each breath you take starts a process of exchanging the carbon dioxide in your blood for the oxygen in your lungs. This exchange works well under normal conditions. But when you fly, changes begin to happen in the air you're breathing. Remember in the section on airplane performance, when we told you that your airplane doesn't perform as well at high altitude as it does at sea level? Well, the same thing happens to your body. Performance decreases when there is not enough oxygen reaching the cells of your body, and is most significant when flying above 10,000 feet MSL without the use of supplemental oxygen. Depriving your body of oxygen results in a condition known as hypoxia, when there is a lack of oxygen in the air you breathe, a condition called hypoxic hypoxia can occur. Hypoxia can occur very suddenly at high altitudes during a rapid climb or during rapid decompression in a pressurized airplane. The onset of hypoxia can also occur very slowly when you fly at low altitudes for an extended period of time. Let's take a look at a couple of examples of how quickly your body reacts to a lack of oxygen at various altitudes. We'll start with an airplane at 25,000 feet MSL. If the oxygen supply is suddenly lost, you have three to five minutes to save your life. Within this period, called the time of useful consciousness, the first symptoms of hypoxia begin to occur and may be severe enough to affect rational decision making. Beyond five minutes at this altitude, decision-making is severely limited. Although you may remain conscious, you may be mentally and physically incapacitated. You will lose consciousness after about nine and a half minutes. Now, let's consider what happens during a rapid decompression at 30,000 feet MSL. There is a dramatic reduction in the time of useful consciousness at this altitude you have about one to two minutes to make a life-saving decision, such as putting on your oxygen mask. The symptoms of hypoxia vary from one individual to the next, and not everyone experiences the same symptoms at the same altitude. Some of the more common symptoms of hypoxia include a lightheaded or dizzy sensation, headache, sweating, tingling sensation, blue fingernails and lips, a reduced visual field, frequent yawning, impaired judgment, a feeling of euphoria or a false sense of well-being, and changes in personality. However, by the time you recognize the symptoms, it may be too late. The key to preventing hypoxia is the timely use of supplemental oxygen. Recovery from hypoxic hypoxia usually occurs very rapidly when supplemental oxygen is used. Although regulations specify altitudes where supplemental oxygen must be used, you should not rely solely on the altimeter to determine when you need to use it. Certain parts of your body are affected by a lack of oxygen before others. Your eyes, for example, may lose some of their acuity, especially at night. Other factors, such as your physical condition and whether or not you smoke, may reduce the altitude where you should use supplemental oxygen. As a general rule, you should consider using oxygen when you fly above 10,000 feet during the day and 5,000 feet at night. Although high altitude flying without oxygen is the primary cause of hypoxia, there are other situations that can cause it. When your blood is unable to absorb a sufficient amount of oxygen, a condition called hypemic hypoxia can occur. A major cause of hypemic hypoxia is carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless, and tasteless gas and is present in exhaust fumes. Under normal conditions, the oxygen that passes through your lungs attaches to hemoglobin in your bloodstream and is then carried to the cells in your body. 
inhaled carbon monoxide attaches itself much more easily to the hemoglobin than does oxygen. In fact, the carbon monoxide may prevent oxygen from attaching itself to the hemoglobin. This results in less oxygen reaching the cells in your body. As you climb to higher altitudes where the air is less dense, you become more susceptible to the effects of hypemic hypoxia. Most light single-engine airplanes are heated by air, which passes over the exhaust manifold. A defective heat exchanger could allow carbon monoxide to enter the cabin. Since it is difficult to tell when carbon monoxide is in the air, you can use a carbon monoxide detector like the one shown here. The dot on the detector changes color to indicate that carbon monoxide is present. If you smell exhaust or suspect that carbon monoxide is entering the cabin, turn off the heater. Open the fresh air vents or windows and use supplemental oxygen if it is available. The symptoms of hypemic hypoxia are very similar to those of hypoxic hypoxia, but your body may take up to 48 hours to rid itself of the carbon monoxide. Some people believe they can prevent hypoxia by breathing rapidly and deeply to get more oxygen. This technique, called hyperventilation, forces too much carbon dioxide out of the bloodstream, which can be very dangerous. Consciously breathing too deeply and rapidly is not the only way to produce hyperventilation. Stressful situations can also induce it. When you become anxious, tense, apprehensive, fearful, or are overworked, your natural breathing rate may radically increase. Without even being aware of it, your increased breathing rate can lead to hyperventilation. Restoring the proper balance of carbon dioxide in your body will help you overcome the problem. You can do this by slowing your breathing rate and restoring it to normal. Recovery from hyperventilation is quite rapid when this is done. Breathing into a paper sack is a common procedure for overcoming hyperventilation. As you rebreathe exhaled carbon dioxide, you're helping to restore a chemical balance in your blood. Talking out loud or talking to other passengers are also good techniques. It is possible to suffer from hyperventilation, even if you're using supplemental oxygen. Because the symptoms of hyperventilation are similar to hypoxia, you need to evaluate your condition carefully and be aware of those symptoms unique to hyperventilation. Another important physiological consideration is how your ears, sinuses, gastrointestinal tract, and teeth are affected by changes in atmospheric pressure as you climb and descend. Your body contains about one quart of air and gas at any given moment. As you climb, the air and gases begin to expand in an attempt to equalize the pressure inside your body with that of the outside air. At 10,000 feet, the air and gases inside your body expand to a volume nearly 50% greater than they were at sea level. As altitude increases, the air continues to expand. At 18,000 feet, the air and gases expand to twice the volume they were at sea level. A gradual climb to altitude will help equalize the pressure and reduce the discomfort caused by the gas expansion. Your ears are the part of your body most commonly affected by changes in pressure. Under normal conditions, the air pressure in your middle ear is equal to the pressure in your ear canal and throat. The eustachian tube that's located between your middle ear and throat is the opening that helps keep this pressure equal. As you climb, the pressure decreases and the air in your middle ear begins to expand as it tries to equalize itself with the outside air pressure. If the eustachian tube is closed, the pressure in your middle ear will continue to build. You will experience pain and possibly a slight hearing loss as the eardrum bulges out toward the ear canal. Yawning is usually a good way to get relief. If this doesn't work, you might have to descend to a lower altitude. Now, let's take a look at what happens during a descent where the opposite condition exists. As you descend, the atmospheric pressure becomes greater than the pressure in your middle ear. 
because the eustachian tube opens more easily to let high pressure out than it does to allow air back into your middle ear, your eardrum might be pushed inward by the higher atmospheric pressure in your ear canal. This is what happens when your ears plug. You can usually open the eustachian tube and relieve the pressure built up by yawning, chewing gum, or swallowing. You can also perform the Valsalva technique to relieve the pressure imbalance. This is done by pinching your nose, closing your mouth, and gently blowing air into your nostrils. You might have to perform this technique several times as you descend. When you perform the Valsalva technique, you are opening your eustachian tube by forcing air through it. With the eustachian tube open, the pressure in your middle ear will become equal to the pressure in your ear canal and throat, and your ears will unplug. Changes in altitude can also cause pain in your sinuses, especially if you have allergies or a cold. Although you can normally eliminate the discomfort by performing the Valsalva technique, you might have to fly at lower altitudes. Poor dental care can be another cause of pain while flying if you have trapped air in fillings, damaged root canals, or abscesses. Scuba diving and flying might seem worlds apart, and from a physiological standpoint, they should be. You're probably familiar with the term, the bends. It describes a diving malady that results from nitrogen that has absorbed into a diver's tissues coming out of solution and forming bubbles in the bloodstream. Although you might finish a dive well within the no decompression limits, the reduced atmospheric pressure you encounter while flying can cause decompression sickness. You should wait at least 12 hours before flying after a no decompression dive and at least 24 hours after a dive requiring decompression. As a pilot, you need to understand how your body reacts to variations in altitude. Because the altitude you fly at can result in an insufficient supply of oxygen, you need to know how you can prevent potential problems. You must also understand that as you climb and descend, changes in atmospheric pressure can affect your flying performance. From time to time, your physician may prescribe a drug to help you fight an illness or to reduce pain and discomfort. You also have thousands of over-the-counter medications that are available to fight a wide variety of ailments. Because of the physical and mental demands of flying, you need to be very careful about mixing drugs and flying. When you're taking medication or not feeling well, you should ask yourself, Am I really healthy enough to fly safely? If you're taking medication for any reason, you also need to understand how your body will react to the drug. In most cases, the label will warn you of the potential side effects of the drug. But your best source of information is your aviation medical examiner. If you have any doubt about the effects of a drug, this person will be able to give you the answers. In addition, your personal physician may prescribe a drug without knowing you are a pilot. Always tell the doctors who treat you that you are a pilot and discuss the potential side effects of the drug before you take it. Let's look briefly at the broad classifications of drugs and some of the problems associated with them. The antihistamines and decongestants that are used to alleviate cold and allergy symptoms often cause drowsiness and slowed motor response. Amphetamines, like those used as appetite suppressants, are potentially dangerous because they can produce restlessness, anxiety, cardiac disturbances, hallucinations, and convulsions. Motion sickness remedies may be very helpful for your passengers in preventing air sickness, but you should not use them yourself. They contain sedatives that can cause drowsiness and decrease your alertness. Common over-the-counter painkillers, such as aspirin, normally produce few side effects when taken in the correct dosage. On the other hand, prescription painkillers, like those used to reduce severe pain, produce side effects that usually preclude flying. These prescription drugs can make you feel dizzy or nauseous, blur your vision, and make flying very dangerous. 
Another substance that produces a drug-like effect is alcohol. It acts as a central nervous system depressant and can severely affect your judgment and motor skills. Obviously, alcohol and flying do not mix, and federal aviation regulations specify guidelines for pilots. These rules prohibit you from flying for eight hours after consuming any alcoholic beverage. In addition, your blood alcohol level must also be below 0.04%. Because of the degrading motor and mental responses produced by consuming alcohol, prudent pilots choose to increase the time between the bottle and the throttle. Offenses involving alcohol and drugs can have serious consequences on your flying career and your flight privileges. All of the following can result in the suspension, revocation, or denial of any certificate, rating, or authorization, or the application thereof. Flying while impaired or intoxicated. Knowingly carrying illegal drugs on board an aircraft. Any conviction of a motor vehicle offense involving alcohol or drugs. Failure to report any conviction of operating a motor vehicle while intoxicated, impaired, or under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Federal regulations require all pilots who are convicted of said offenses to file a written report to the FAA Civil Aviation Security Division no later than 60 days after the conviction. Also, be aware that the Department of Transportation audits motor vehicle records to locate pilots with alcohol or drug-related motor vehicle offenses. Nicotine and caffeine are two drugs that are regularly used by many pilots. Although they are not prohibited by regulations, the nicotine found in tobacco and the caffeine contained in coffee, tea, and soda can alter your flying performance. Smoking increases your susceptibility to hypoxia and can damage the delicate bearings in flight instruments. Caffeine may cause extreme nervousness, stomach irritation, and muscle tremors, all of which can reduce your performance. Although modern medicine allows you to continue with many activities when you're feeling under the weather, there can be no compromises when it comes to flight safety. Flying requires a healthy, alert pilot. Knowing your physical limitations and the possible side effects of various medications will help to make you a safe and responsible pilot. Aeronautical decision-making is an ongoing process requiring a continuous assessment of what's happening around you, or more commonly called, situation awareness. To help you get a feel for some of the decisions you might make during a flight, this program presents some situations that you may encounter. The first example takes a pilot on a cross-country flight from Grand Island, Nebraska, to an important job interview in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Because the mind is very complex, it would be impossible to cover every thought process. However, you'll see how your personal attitude, level of pilot skill, ability to identify risk and handle stress all combine to help you formulate decision-making strategies. You'll also be given an opportunity to see the results of some of these decisions, which you personally might or might not make. Good morning, Cessna 52241. I'm going VFR from Grand Island, Nebraska to Cheyenne, Wyoming. I'd like a standard briefing. Okay. High pressure in northwestern Wyoming continues to dominate most of your route. However, the weak cold front that was expected to pass through Grand Island by 1300 Zulu is just now moving through southwestern Nebraska. Grand Island is currently 7,000 scattered with high cirrus. The forecast calls for 5,000 broken, visibility 1-0 at 1,400 Zulu when the front passes. North Platte indicates 8,000 scattered, visibility 20, and is forecast to remain the same for the rest of the day. Cheyenne is currently 10,000 scattered, visibility 1-5, and they expect clear skies by 1,700 Zulu. So the front will bring some clouds into your area, 
but good VFR conditions should dominate your route. The current winds aloft, Grand Island 6,330 at 1.5, 9,330 at 1.8, 12,320. With the known winds, you can now add the estimated times en route between checkpoints. Then complete the performance calculations for the airplane. After completing your performance calculations and filing your flight plan, you begin preparing the airplane for the trip. As you know, the pre-flight inspection is one of the most important parts of your flight preparation. While you're still on the ground, you have plenty of time to assess the airplane's suitability for making the flight. Now you're ready to go, but are you? Before you start the engine, let's take a quick look at your evaluation of the airplane's airworthiness. If you had looked closer at the fuel container, you would have seen that water is present in the fuel. Although finding contaminants in your fuel is about the risk you'll take if you don't assure they're completely removed before takeoff. Another potential problem area is the oil level. The dipstick shows you have five quarts of oil, which for the airplane is the minimum amount. However, for extended flights, such as a cross country, you should fill it to seven quarts. Just remember that as the pilot in command of an airplane, you're responsible for deciding whether it's airworthy or not. A careful pre-flight inspection helps you determine its condition. Now that you're confident the plane is airworthy, you're ready to start the engine. Grand Island Airport, information Bravo. 1345 Zulu weather, temperature 47, dew point 33. Wind 340 at 10, altimeter 3005, landing and departing runway 35. Advise ground control on initial contact, you have information, Bravo. Grand Island Ground, Cessna 52241 at the General Aviation Ramp, ready for taxi 35 with information, Bravo. Cessna 241, taxi to runway 35. Cessna 241. Cherokee 8228 Yankee at Foxtrot, 
Ready to taxi 35 with information Bravo. Cherokee 28 Yankee, taxi to runway 35. Alpha 2 intersection departure, 3,500 feet available. Cherokee 28 Yankee requests full length. Roger 28 Yankee, taxi to runway 35. 28 Yankee. For some reason, the Cherokee pilot did not want to use the intersection takeoff. Are you still sure you do? There could be several reasons why the Cherokee pilot declined the intersection takeoff. One of these might be that he is closer to the approach end of the runway. For you, the most obvious concern is that there is enough runway to complete the takeoff. During your pre-flight planning calculations, you determined that you needed only 1,440 feet to take off and clear a 50-foot obstacle. So, with 3,500 feet available, there's plenty of runway for a safe takeoff. Grand Island Tower, Cessna 52241, ready for takeoff, runway 35, Alpha 2, VFR westbound. Cessna 241, fly runway heading, cleared for takeoff, runway 35. Cessna 241. Your decision to depart from the runway intersection does not involve a definite right or wrong answer. This decision depends on your level of pilot skill, the airplane's performance capability, and the runway itself. It also includes weighing the risks. What if you lost power right now? Remember that water which you almost left in the tank? If the engine fails at this point, the runway behind you doesn't do you much good. You are now established in cruising flight and are about an hour and a half west of Grand Island. It's important to maintain a constant awareness of your situation while en route by performing a thorough scan for traffic and by monitoring the various gauges and instruments to ensure everything is operating properly. Your situational awareness is important because accidents are often caused by a chain of events rather than one particular occurrence. This means that if you fail to monitor the flight's progress, you might not detect a problem or a change from the desired situation. Or, if you make a bad decision, further problems may begin to compound and the situation may become too stressful for you to handle. One of the best ways of keeping abreast of your flight is to always know where you are. This includes performing time, speed, and distance checks to help you keep track of your progress. Between your last two checkpoints, you find that your ground speed has been reduced by 21 knots from your pre-flight estimate. Did the winds change, or did you just miscalculate? After confirming that you didn't miscalculate, and that you're still maintaining the planned true airspeed, you should check the winds. Flywatch, Cessna 52241, Searle VOR, over. Cessna 52241, Denver Flightwatch, go ahead. Cessna 241 is 10 west of Searle VOR, 8500 at 10, VFR from Grand Island to Cheyenne. Request current winds aloft up to 12,000 between North Platte and Cheyenne. The current winds aloft indicate the headwinds have indeed increased. Since the winds are just as strong below and stronger above, there isn't much point in trying a different cruising altitude. After calculating your estimated time en route, you find that if the headwinds persist, you'll arrive just in time to make the interview, and your fuel reserve will be reduced to about 20 minutes. You now have an important decision to make. If you continue, you can still make it to the interview on time. After all, you still have 20 minutes of fuel reserve. But what if the winds increase? Or what if your calculations are slightly off? Another option would be to land at an alternate airport and refuel. Wouldn't it be better to arrive a little late than not at all? You could always make a phone call to let the interviewer know of your circumstances and hope he'll understand. What decision would you make in this situation? In this case, you rule out the thought of continuing with such a limited fuel reserve and opt for diverting for fuel. Now you have to decide where to land. 
As you assess the possible options, you look at your current position and the various airports nearby. Searle Airport, just west of Ogallala, is one possibility, although it's now nearly 15 miles behind you. Chapel is another choice and is almost directly on course. Sydney is also an option, but it is farther away. Because Chapel is the closest airport along your route to Cheyenne, you decide to deviate slightly and land there to avoid depleting your fuel reserve any more than you have to. Columbus Radio, Cessna 52241, transmitting 122.1, .1, listening Sydney VOR. Cessna 52241, Columbus Radio, go ahead. Cessna 241 is 15 west of Ogallala at 15 VFR from Grand Island to Cheyenne. I'm experiencing strong headwinds and I'm going to land at Chapel for fuel. Request you advise Casper Flight Service to extend my flight plan by one hour. I'll contact you again as soon as I'm airborne. Roger, 241. We'll extend your VFR flight plan. Sydney altimeter, 29er, 9er 8. As you approach Chapel Airport, you feel good about your decision to divert. Because you were doing such a good job monitoring the flight, you detected the headwinds. Thus, you eliminated the possibility of inducing a stressful and potentially dangerous situation had you continued toward Cheyenne with such a limited fuel reserve. There doesn't seem to be anyone around to give you some fuel. In fact, the fuel pump is locked and the airport seems almost abandoned. Maybe you can call someone to come out and fill you up. The only problem is that there doesn't seem to be a telephone anywhere. How are you going to contact the interviewer to let him know you're running late? If you had taken a good look at this alternate, you would have seen that the airport symbol does not have the tick marks which indicate service is available. This airport happens to be unattended. Let's go back to the decision point and look at some other options. When you made the decision to divert, there was plenty of time to identify the many alternatives available. Although you've already passed Searle Field, the airport does indicate the availability of services. By turning around to divert, the strong headwinds would become tailwinds, and you would be there in no time. Another good possibility is Sydney. It too shows services available. And not only is it safely within range, but it's also directly along your route of flight. You could always contact Sydney Unicom while in the air to make sure fuel is available and that someone is there to pump it for you. With that choice in mind, let's continue ahead and refuel at Sydney. Sydney Unicom, Cessna 52241, 10 East, 6500. VFR inbound, request airport advisories. Cessna 52241, Sydney Unicom. The surface winds are 320 at 12 knots, favoring runway 33. A warrior's in the pattern shooting touch and goes on runway 27, right traffic. Sydney altimeter is 29097. Again, you have a decision to make. Although the winds favor one runway, another airplane is practicing crosswind landings on the other. Which runway will you use? With the Cherokee in sight, you decide to enter the pattern and follow it in for a crosswind landing. After all, you've had quite a bit of practice, and the wind does not exceed the airplane's maximum demonstrated crosswind component. Sydney traffic, Cessna 241, entering right downwind, runway 27, following the Cherokee turning final, Sydney. When you're established on downwind, you begin to notice the strength of the wind because it's taking a fairly substantial crab angle to maintain the proper ground track. As you turn to final, the strength of the crosswind can really be felt. Approaching the runway, you need to apply more crab than you have ever experienced, and you're having a difficult time aligning the airplane with the runway center line. Should you continue the approach or try something different? Sydney traffic, Cessna 241 is going around runway 27, 
I'll enter a left downwind for runway 33. I have the Cherokee in sight and will land after it's clear of runway 27. Your decision for discontinuing the crosswind approach is a very important one. The margin of safety provided during the approach and landing is small. Because your task requirements are highest during this phase of operation, the risk of an accident is also highest. Therefore, if you feel uncomfortable during the approach, break it off. Just because someone else is using the runway for crosswind practice does not mean you have to put yourself in the same risk, especially if you feel that the wind is too strong for your airplanes or your own capabilities. Well, I picked up some strong headwinds and had to land for some more fuel. I should be there in about two hours. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. After refueling, you climb back to cruising flight and continue toward Cheyenne. Sydney traffic, Cessna 632 turning final for 3-3. Sydney Unicom, Beach Niner 41, North 5. After passing Pine Bluffs, you pick up the highway and follow it into Cheyenne. About 15 miles out, you begin your descent and start to prepare for the arrival. Cheyenne Tower, Cessna 52241, 15 East, VFR inbound for landing. Cheyenne Tower, Cessna 52241, 15 East, VFR inbound for landing. Cheyenne Tower doesn't seem to be answering, since Cheyenne has an operating control tower and is in Class D airspace. You must establish radio communications before entering the area. Therefore, you're going to have to make a decision. You could always land someplace else and have the radio fixed. As you look at your present position, you realize that your options here are pretty limited. Pine Bluffs is close, but the symbol indicates the airport is unattended, so it's unlikely to have a radio shop. Every other choice is at least 35 or 40 miles away. Another possibility is to follow the lost communications procedures by entering the traffic pattern and waiting for light signals from the tower. That choice sounds more feasible, so you continue toward Cheyenne. Before you resign yourself to the fact that the radio is broken, you probably should try to figure out what's wrong with it. In fact, this should have been the first thing you did when you suspected radio failure. Cheyenne Tower, Cessna 52241. Cheyenne Unicom, Cessna 241, how do you read? West wind and runway information. Cheyenne Tower, Cessna 52241, 11 East, VFR inbound for landing. Cessna 241, how do you read? Cheyenne Tower, Cessna 241, loud and clear. Cessna 241, Cheyenne Tower, enter a right base, runway 34. Wind 330 at 15, altimeter 3001. Report 3 east of the airport. Cessna 241. Cheyenne Tower, Cessna 241 is 3 east. Cessna 241 cleared to land. Caution, wake turbulence, departing DC-9 on runway 26. Now you have a couple of quick decisions to make. 
Your first one is which runway to land on. You were initially instructed to enter a right base for runway 34. Now the controller simply cleared you to land. Does this mean you're to land on runway 34 or behind the departing jet on runway 26? Which one would you choose? Cheyenne Tower, Cessna 241, request clarification. Am I cleared to land on runway 26? Negative 241, you're cleared to land runway 34. Caution, wake turbulence from a DC-9, which is departing on runway 26. Cessna 241. Anytime you're uncertain of the meaning of a clearance, regulations require you to immediately request clarification from ATC. By asking the controller to clarify his instructions, you not only conform to regulations, but also eliminate the risk of conflicting with other traffic by landing on the wrong runway. The next decision you have to make is how to avoid the wake turbulence produced by the departing jet. If you assume the controller's mandatory separation will assure that you'll avoid the wake turbulence, you may be in for quite a shock because as you near the runway, the airplane becomes difficult to control. So how can you reduce the chance of encountering the wake turbulence? One way is to extend your landing pattern to give the vortices a chance to subside. In addition, you should follow the appropriate vortex avoidance procedures. As you taxi to the ramp, you realize that flying requires a continuous stream of decisions. It's important to recognize when a decision is necessary, then to analyze the situation and determine the best course of action. As a pilot, you must constantly evaluate the interaction of yourself, the airplane, the environment, and the purpose of each flight. This will help you decide whether to start a particular flight, continue as planned, or to make modifications. Here is another example to help illustrate this point. This time, we'll follow a cross-country pilot through the last portion of his flight and see how he uses situational awareness to make some crucial decisions. There's the reservoir off to the left. At 28 past the hour, so I should be at Lamar in 15 minutes. Lamar Unicom Warrior 81312, 20 Southeast, 8,500. Landing Lamar, request wind and runway information for Lamar. Over. Warrior 312 Lamar, the winds are 070 at 10, favoring runway 08. There is a Cessna on the left downwind for runway 08. Lamar traffic, Cessna 241 is left base for 08 at Lamar, touch and go. Well, if they're landing on 08, then I'll angle over this direction and set up for the downwind so I can check the traffic. That's a fairly drastic wind change. Almost 90 degrees and 20 knots in just a couple of minutes. Those clouds might be building into something nasty. If they are, it'll be a lot sooner than forecast. Lamar traffic, Cessna 241 is downwind for runway 35, touch and go at Lamar. If that's a gust front, I may have to think twice about getting into Lamar. But that Cessna must not think it's getting bad enough to full stop. After all, I'm only 10 minutes away. I shouldn't have any problem. Lamar Unicom, Cessna 241 is left base, runway 35. Wind check, please. Cessna 241, Lamar winds are now 320 at 35. Roger, Cessna 241, this will be a full stop. 
It sounds like these things are building into full-blown thunderstorms. I wonder if this is going on all around me. I think I'll check another airport. Stanton County Unicom or your 81312. Request wind and runway information for Stanton County. Over. Warrior 312, Stanton County Unicom. Winds are light and variable, favoring runway 35. Roger, Stanton County, Warrior 312. Uh, do you have any thunderstorm activity in the area? Negative 312, just a few clouds to the west. Well, that sounds a lot better. Attention all of our traffic. We have an airplane off the right side of runway 35, about 2,000 feet down the runway. Winds at Lamar are now 300 at 35, gusting to 40. That settles that. I don't think I want to wind up in the grass at Lamar. I'd better figure out what I'm going to do. I'm right about here. I hate to backtrack all the way to Stanton County. If there's some place closer to sit and wait this thing out, Springfield's closer. It's unattended, but somebody might be in the pattern who can tell me what the winds are doing. Springfield traffic, warrior 81312, over. Springfield traffic, this is warrior 81312, over. Well, that didn't work. If I head over to Springfield and find out it's no good, then have to go to Stanton County. That'll take almost 40 minutes, and I can't do that without cutting into my fuel reserve. In 40 minutes, things at Stanton County could turn just as bad as Lamar and I'd be low on fuel and options. Besides, it looks like the thunderstorms are building up over at Springfield, too. It's a long way back, but I'd better go wait this thing out at Stanton County. At least I know what the situation is there. Denver Radio, Warrior 81312, listening 116.9er. Warrior 312, Denver, go ahead. Roger, Denver Radio. Warrior 81312 has a change to the VFR flight plan. Original destination was Lamar. New destination is Stanton County. Original ETA was... This pilot has just made one of the most difficult decisions a cross-country pilot can make. That is, to turn back along his route and land at a suitable place to wait out some bad weather. By maintaining his situational awareness of the area and applying his knowledge of thunderstorm hazards, he was able to visualize his limitations, make the right choice, and stay out of a situation that exceeded his ability. Cockpit Resource Management, or CRM, has become a popular subject in the aviation industry. Although it was originally designed to improve crew coordination and efficiency for airline crew members, CRM is no longer limited to the airline, corporate, or commuter multi-crew environment. But what exactly is CRM? Basically, it's the method of making optimum use of the pilot's capabilities, the aircraft systems, and all available resources to achieve the safest and most efficient flight operations. In this program, we'll explore the resources available to you during single pilot operations, such as your personal resources of knowledge, skill, ability, and attitude, as well as external resources, such as flight information publications, the pilot's operating handbook and checklist, and the airplane systems. For some time, the FAA has required applicants for practical tests to show competency in selected cockpit management areas. This applies to the private, commercial, CFI, multi-engine, and ATP practical tests. 
The subject areas here reflect mostly cockpit organization and safety-related items, such as passenger safety briefings and seatbelt usage. However, these subject areas do not fully express the total concept of CRM. In the past, instructors taught only the technical aspects of flying, such as short field takeoff and landing techniques, recovery from stalls, or cross-country procedures. This gave flight training a procedural orientation. Management skills, such as decision-making, organization, and problem-solving were often missing from the training session. Some students may have been fortunate enough to receive such training, but typically it was covered only briefly and usually in one session. Today, perceptive instructors realize that for CRM to be effective, the training should be included from the beginning and reinforced throughout the training program. This way, the student can develop important CRM skills as well as essential pilot motor skills. Part of the CRM concept is using all available resources in the most effective manner. So what resources are available to you during single pilot flight operations? You may not realize it, but you carry the most valuable resources around with you every day, namely your own knowledge, skills, and abilities. There's no substitute for knowledge. Aviation, as any pilot or aspiring pilot soon discovers, involves more than just piloting an airplane. There's a vast amount of information that every pilot needs to get around in today's airspace. Airport operations, proper radio phraseology, and meteorology are typical of aviation subjects that require specialized knowledge. Knowledge will also help you in times of emergency. For example, how well do you know your aircraft systems? Could you troubleshoot a problem in flight if you had to? Your knowledge of your airplane systems may prevent a minor inconvenience from turning into a major problem. As a student in training, you are constantly learning some new skill. One of the most important is radio communications. As a pilot, you often need to exchange information effectively and quickly with ATC controllers and flight service station personnel, as well as other pilots. However, communication skills involve more than just knowing the proper phraseology. You must also learn how to listen carefully and then learn how to get your message across in the most efficient manner. The third personal resource that you have at your disposal is your ability this involves combining your knowledge and skill and putting them to practical use. For example, making a go-no-go no go decision for a cross-country based on weather interpretation is an ability. There's one more important aspect of CRM that involves your personal resources. Your attitude. The whole purpose of cockpit resource management is to enhance safety. You can be the most knowledgeable, skilled pilot in the world, but unless you have a safety-conscious attitude to match, you're as much a hazard as the less informed, less skilled pilot. Earlier, in, you were introduced to the five hazardous attitudes and their antidotes. Let's take a moment now to review them. Along with your personal resources, you have other resources available to you in the cockpit. For example, your checklist is a valuable asset that should be used for every phase of flight. In an emergency, it ensures that no critical items are overlooked. A current sectional chart provides you with highly detailed information to help you get to your destination. Your airplane's instruments and equipment can also help you reach your destination if you use them properly. Advanced navigation systems, such as GPS, require that you become thoroughly familiar with your particular unit. But once you know how to use it, you have another valuable resource. In addition to items in the cockpit, you have various external resources at your disposal. 
For instance, a call to FlightWatch can give you current weather along your route. If under radar surveillance, ATC can provide you with radar vectors around weather. If radar is not available and you are lost, certain flight service stations can provide a DF steer to point you in the right direction. You can read about these and other services available to you in the AIM as well as in other flight information publications. Now that you have an idea of what resources are available to you, let's put them together with other decision-making elements. Situational awareness is essentially knowing your condition, the airplane's condition, and your surroundings. A decision-making model known as DECIDE represents a logical method for solving a problem. The letters stand for Detect that a change has been made. Estimate the significance of the change. Choose a safe outcome. Identify plausible actions to control the change. Do something. Then evaluate the effect of the action. Finally, set priorities. During your training, your instructor may have introduced a short priority list, like aviate, navigate, and communicate. Let's try this scenario and combine all that you've learned so far. Assume you're on your way to your final destination, an airport in Class B airspace. You try to establish communications. Nothing. You try again. Still nothing. You need to make a decision. Situation. You're a few miles from Class B airspace and your radio is inoperative. Decide. Radio inoperative. Unable to contact ATC. Must remain outside airspace. Re-establish communications. Follow lost communication procedures. You turn to the emergency checklist. As you know, most general aviation aircraft don't have a checklist for lost communications. Therefore, you must rely on your knowledge of aircraft systems and lost communication procedures. Next, set your priorities. Clear the area and begin a turn to remain outside of Class B airspace. Now, you troubleshoot the radio and mic. Check the volume, frequency, the comm panel switches, the mic jack connection, and try the hand mic. Nothing. The last piece of the decide model is filled in. No response. You decide to divert to an airport in Class D airspace. Quickly determine an approximate heading, ground speed, estimated time en route, and fuel burn to the new airport. Unable to establish communications. Squawk 7600. Using the recommended lost comm procedures in the AIM, check the area for traffic and determine the flow. Assured that you're clear of traffic, join the pattern and look for light signals. You see a flashing green light, meaning return for landing. Acknowledge the signal by rocking your wings. Shortly after, you receive a steady green light cleared to land. Again, you rock your wings. Perform your before landing checklist and prepare to land. Through effective use of your personal and external resources, you've made what could have been a serious situation into a minor inconvenience. In this program, we've discussed some of the resources available to you during single pilot VFR operations and some of the decision-making processes. Keep in mind that cockpit resource management is not a static discipline. Rather, it's constantly evolving and all pilots can benefit from the increased safety it provides.
The most exciting and challenging part of your pilot training is learning the maneuvers you will demonstrate for the examiner during your practical test. This program is designed to help you develop the necessary skills to accurately and safely maneuver your airplane. When you begin flight training, your instructor will demonstrate each maneuver for you. Then you will practice the maneuver. To ensure that you have control of the airplane and ensure there is no confusion, you and your instructor should exercise positive exchange of flight controls. The FAA suggests this simple verbal exercise to ensure the flying pilot knows the non-flying pilot has accepted control and is flying the aircraft. Do you have any questions about this one? Nope, I don't think so. You want to give it a try? Sure. You have the flight controls. I have the flight controls. You have the flight controls. Another safety consideration while maneuvering your airplane in the practice area is collision avoidance. In the practice environment, you can be easily distracted, so you should make a special effort to maintain your visual scan while maneuvering. On the other hand, before you begin a maneuver, you should make clearing turns, which usually consist of at least a 180 degree change in direction, such as two 90 degree turns. Clearing turns provide you with a view of the area around your flight path and make it easier to maintain visual contact with other aircraft in the practice area. Your instructor will show you how to clear the area prior to maneuvering. Since most of the maneuvers you are going to learn during your flight training are practiced at relatively low altitude, you should always be vigilant for appropriate emergency landing sites. Good choices for emergency landing sites might be open pastures, turf farms, and hard-packed dirt fields. A road is not always a good option because some may have power lines, trees, or a lot of traffic. It is important to remember that some maneuvers, when not properly executed, may place unusually high load factors on your aircraft. To avoid this, you should be aware of your airplane's operating and airspeed limitations and listen carefully to your instructor so you do not overstress the aircraft. For specific information, refer to your pilot's operating handbook. No matter what type of aircraft you are flying, you need to make sure it is airworthy and safe to fly before you leave the ground. An organized procedure helps you check the systems and equipment in the airplane. This procedure is called the pre-flight inspection. Regardless of how many times you perform the pre-flight, always use the written checklist provided for the airplane you're flying. This step-by-step -step procedure ensures that you examine every item and the airplane is ready to fly. This program is designed to give general guidelines to follow during the pre-flight and engine start. Keep in mind that pre-flight procedures can vary among aircraft of the same make and model and obviously between manufacturers. Start your inspection in the cabin by checking to see all required paperwork is in order, including the airworthiness certificate. Registration. FCC radio station license, the pilot's operating handbook or the approved flight manual, and weight and balance information. Set the parking brake to ensure that the airplane will not move once the wheel chocks and wing tie downs are removed. Next, remove the control wheel lock to free the control surfaces for the walk around inspection. This will also expose the ignition magneto switch and avionics power switch so that you can check to ensure both are in the off position. It is important to note that the engine could fire if the ignition magneto switch is in the on position and someone moves the propeller. Turn the master switch to on. If a split rocker switch is installed, Turn the battery side on to use the power to check the fuel quantity indicators and to listen for the sound of the avionics cooling fan. The indications of the fuel gauges should correspond to the actual fuel level you will check later. Once you have noted the fuel levels and verified the operation of the fan, lower the flaps and turn the master switch off. The fuel selector valve should be in the both position. By moving the selector slightly to the left and right, you should feel a detent position, which indicates the valve is in the proper position for flight.
Check the baggage door to confirm that it's locked. As you move toward the tail section, inspect the general condition of the fuselage, looking for abnormalities in the skin, such as wrinkles or loose rivets. Also make sure all antennas and access panels are secure. Inspect the stabilizer surfaces for general condition, looking for dents, wrinkles, and loose rivets. Examine the control surfaces on the tail, checking for freedom of movement and security. Then check the control cables for excess play and loose or missing safety wires. Check both sides of the control surface attachment points for loose bolts and apparent damage and remove the tail tie down. Continue your walk around as you inspect the remainder of the tail section. Check the right side of the fuselage for imperfections and damage. This also provides an excellent opportunity for you to visually inspect the top surface of the wing. Next, inspect the right wing flap tracks for security and wear. Moving outboard to the wing tip, inspect the aileron hinges for security, wear, and freedom of movement. In addition, check the aileron pushrod for damage and security. Check the wing tip for possible damage and security. Then, inspect the right navigation light. Check the leading edge of the wing for dents and other damage. Inspect the attachment points of the main landing gear for dents or wrinkles. Visually check the tire for wear, cuts, abrasions, and proper inflation. Examine the hydraulic brakes and brake lines for security and leaks. With a fuel strainer, drain a few ounces of fuel from the quick drain to check for sediment, water, and any contaminants. Also, note the color of the fuel to confirm it is the proper grade for the airplane. This check should be accomplished before the first flight each day and after refueling. Some airplanes have a fuel selector quick drain and an additional fuel line quick drain located on the bottom of the fuselage. Both should be sampled and checked for sediment, contamination, water, and proper fuel grade. Remove the fuel cap and make sure the level in the tank corresponds to that indicated on the fuel gauge. The fuel cap on the right wing is vented, so visually inspect it for damage and obstructions. Then carefully check the general condition of the wing surface. During winter months and in cold climates, make sure the surface is free of frost and snow accumulation. As you move to the nose section, ensure the windshield is clean and check the general condition of the cowling. Look under the nose section for fuel or oil leaks. Check the oil level to ensure the quantity is sufficient for the flight. Keep in mind, the pilot operating handbook specifies a higher minimum amount of oil for extended flights than it does for short or local flights. Pull the fuel strainer knob for several seconds to clear the strainer of any possible water and sediment. Ensure the knob is full in and closed. With the cowling secured, continue to the propeller and spinner. Carefully inspect the propeller for defects, such as nicks and cracks. Look into the inlets to make sure they are clear of obstructions. Check the alternator belt through the air inlet. Visually check the condition and ensure that it has the proper tension. Verify the landing light is intact and clean. Then examine the air filter to make sure it's clean, secured, and not damaged. Check the nose wheel tire for wear, damage, and proper inflation. Also, inspect the condition of the gear strut. Make sure the static port located on the fuselage is clean and unobstructed. Check the left main landing gear and drain a few ounces of fuel from the quick drain to check for sediment, water, and any contaminants. Then inspect the fuel quantity and the left wing in the same way as the right. An additional item to check on this wing is the pitot tube. Make sure the opening in the front of the pitot tube is clean and free of obstructions. An important part of the fuel system check is to make sure the fuel tank vent is open. This vent 
relieves pressure and allows fuel to escape from the tank during hot conditions. It also prevents a partial vacuum from forming as fuel is being used. Another important item to check is the stall warning detector on the leading edge of the wing. It should move freely and be unobstructed. You can test the warning horn by turning the master switch on, lifting the detector, and listening for the horn. Examine the left aileron and the flap for damage, wear, and freedom of movement. If you find a problem during the pre-flight, have it checked by a certified maintenance technician before you fly the airplane. Each airplane has its own unique starting procedure. The procedure itself can vary depending on whether the engine is cold, hot, or flooded, or whether external power is used. It's extremely important to use the checklist for your airplane as well as the one for the appropriate conditions. Before you start the engine, adjust your seat for comfort and visibility. Make sure the seat is locked into position and will not slip. Then, fasten your seatbelt and shoulder harness. If you're carrying passengers, be sure to brief them on how to fasten their seatbelts and shoulder harnesses and how to latch and unlatch the cabin doors. For safety, test the brakes by pressing on the top of the rudder pedals with your toes, then reset the parking brake. To avoid possible damage to the avionics, make sure the avionics power switch is turned off then visually check and slide your fingers across the circuit breakers to make sure they are in and set. As an added precaution, verify that all electrical equipment, including the autopilot, is turned off. You should now check the fuel selector, ensuring it is in the both position. In warm temperatures, one or two strokes of the primer should be sufficient. In cold weather, up to six strokes of the primer may be necessary. Moving back to the throttle quadrant, place the carburetor heat lever to the cold position and open the throttle one-eighth of an inch. Now set the mixture control to rich. Visually clear the area in the vicinity of the airplane. Make sure you look behind the airplane to ensure that debris from the prop wash will not endanger people or vehicles on the ramp. Then open the window and call out clear. Where? and look and listen for a response. Turn on the master switch. Then engage the starter by turning the ignition magneto switch to the start position. When the engine fires, release the starter switch and advance the throttle to the appropriate setting. Check the oil pressure gauge to assure that it registers adequately. If the pressure does not register within 30 seconds to a minute, shut down the engine and determine the cause. During your training, you will learn the importance of the pre-flight inspection and how it enhances flying safety. As you get ready to taxi for takeoff, you'll know that the extra time you spent covering all of the items on the checklist will help you to make sure your airplane is ready to fly. Like every other aspect of flying, you must employ special techniques when you operate on the ground to ensure you maintain control of your airplane. Let's take a look at those procedures. When you're ready to taxi, advance the throttle just enough to start the airplane rolling forward. Apply the brakes as soon as you start forward to make sure they're working properly you'll find that more power is needed to start the airplane rolling than is needed to keep it moving. Your speed should be kept slow, especially in congested areas on the ramp. Control your taxi speed primarily with the throttle. Although applying the brakes will help you slow down, they should be used only when a throttle reduction is insufficient. This prevents excessive wear and overheating of the brakes. Steering is quite simple on most tricycle gear airplanes. Since the nose wheel is linked to the rudder pedals, applying pressure to them causes the nose wheel and rudder to deflect and turns the airplane. Because the engine is cooled by airflow, a prolonged taxi can cause it to overheat. 
Monitor the engine gauges closely and follow the manufacturer's recommended procedures to improve cooling. Wind blowing over the airplane and its control surfaces is another consideration when taxiing. Let's take a look at several situations and see how the flight controls are used to overcome the adverse effects of wind. There are two general guidelines you should follow. If the wind is blowing toward the front of the airplane, turn the control wheel toward the wind and apply neutral or slight forward pressure. If the wind is from behind the airplane, turn the control wheel away from the wind and push it full forward. Let's take a look at why these general guidelines are true. When you taxi into a direct headwind, the air moves equally above and below the wings. With the control wheel in the neutral position, the airplane exhibits the same stable handling characteristics as it does in flight. In a direct tailwind, moving the control wheel full forward places the elevator in the down position. In this situation, the wind strikes the upper surface and exerts pressure on the top of the elevator. This prevents the tail from being lifted and the airplane from nosing over. A wind from the side, such as this quartering headwind, tends to lift the upwind wing and roll the airplane. When you turn the control wheel into the wind, the upwind aileron moves up and the downwind aileron moves down. The wind flowing over the control surfaces tends to push the left wing down, the right wing up, and counteracts the tipping tendency. If the wind is behind the airplane, as with this left quartering tailwind, you'll need to position the controls differently. Again, the wind tends to lift the upwind wing. It also tends to lift the tail. In this situation, move the control wheel opposite the wind direction and apply forward pressure. This raises the right aileron, lowers the left aileron, and places the elevator in the down position. As the wind blows across the airplane, the aerodynamic forces created by the displaced ailerons and elevator will counteract the rolling and tipping tendencies. The wind flowing over the airplane changes as you turn, and you'll need to reposition the control surfaces. Always be aware of the wind direction. Even in very light winds, position the controls appropriately. After taxiing to the run-up area, align the nose of your aircraft into the wind. Try to keep the propeller blast away from the other aircraft. Using a printed checklist from the aircraft manufacturer, make sure every item is checked and nothing is omitted. Whether you set the parking brake or hold the brakes with your feet, you should divide your attention between cockpit duties and outside the aircraft to make sure it doesn't start moving forward during the run-up. Make sure the cabin doors are closed and locked. Also, close and lock both windows. When you turn the control wheel to the right, the right aileron will move up and the left aileron will move down. Conversely, turning the controls to the left will move the left aileron up and the right aileron down. To help you remember which aileron is up, place both hands on the control wheel and move it to the right. If you extend your thumbs, they will point to the aileron in the up position. Pulling back on the control wheel will cause the elevator to move up, and pushing forward on the control wheel will move the elevator down. To check the rudder for proper operation, depress the right rudder pedal, and it will move the rudder to the right. Left rudder pedal pressure will cause the rudder to move to the left. Next, check and set your flight instruments. Set the altimeter to the current altimeter setting, or if the current setting is not available, adjust it to the field elevation. Check and adjust your attitude indicator to ensure the miniature aircraft is in a wings level position on the horizon bar. Set the heading indicator to the magnetic compass indication. Place the fuel selector valve to the fullest tank or to the both position, as recommended in the pilot's operating handbook. Now, set the elevator trim to the takeoff position. 
smoothly advance the throttle to the appropriate RPM and adjust the mixture control as required for the field elevation or as recommended in the pilot's operating handbook. If your pilot's operating handbook has an amplified procedure section, refer to the section on leaning the mixture for high altitude operation and high field elevations. To check the magnetos, move the ignition switch first to the right position and note the RPM drop. Move the switch back to the both position and then move the ignition switch to the left position and note the RPM drop. Return the switch to the both position. Switching from both magnetos to the left or right magneto individually should cause the engine RPM to drop. In most cases, a drop of around 125 RPM is acceptable for individual magneto operation. However, the difference between the left and right magneto drop should not exceed 25 to 50 RPM, depending on manufacturer's recommendations. If you don't get a drop in RPM, it may be the result of a faulty magneto ground wire, and the aircraft should not be flown. Apply carburetor heat and check for a drop in RPM. Then return the carburetor heat control to the off position. In some geographical areas, with high humidity or visible moisture, you can experience carburetor ice while taxiing. This may be noted by a larger initial drop in RPM followed by a slight increase in RPM. The initial drop may be accompanied by engine roughness, which should subside with the RPM increase. Check the suction gauge. It should be indicating between 4.5 and 5.4 inches of mercury. Now, check the ammeter. The ammeter shows the charging rate applied to the battery. If the alternator is not working or the electrical load exceeds the output of the alternator, the ammeter indicates the battery discharge rate. Reduce the power back to idle RPM and begin an avionics check. Check the transponder. For a VFR flight, you should use the code number of 1200 in your transponder. However, some tower controlled airports have special local procedures and may assign a discrete code. Once you have confirmed the transponder code, check the communication and nav aid frequencies. Quickly review the performance airspeeds and departure procedures and finish the checklist items. Of course, airspeeds and procedures will vary with aircraft. Correct procedures are those recommended in the pilot's operating handbook for your aircraft. Release the parking brake. Always check for other traffic before you leave the run-up area, including the final approach path, taxiways you may cross to get to the runway, and the runway itself. Remember, opposite direction traffic may be in effect. You should also check for traffic when departing a tower-controlled field. Proper engine shutdown requires that you use the appropriate checklist, just as you did for the engine start. Make sure the radios, electrical equipment, and avionics power switches are turned off. Then, place the mixture control in idle cutoff. When the engine has stopped, turn the ignition magneto and master switches off. Next, install the control lock to prevent wind gusts from damaging the flight controls. Then, be sure to place the fuel selector valve in the left or right position to prevent cross-feeding. It's important to remember that your flight is not complete until the airplane is secure. In some cases, you may have to move the airplane into the tie-down space by using its tow bar. As you steer the airplane, remember that it is sometimes difficult to judge how close the wingtips and tail are to other aircraft or obstacles. You may want to have someone at the wingtips to help guide the airplane. Once you're in position, place wheel chocks in front and behind the main wheels to prevent the airplane from moving. You should also make certain that the wing and tail tie-downs are properly secured. A key element to a safe, successful flight 
is maintaining positive control of your airplane. This is just as important on the ground as it is in the air. By taking the time to learn proper ground operations, you will be adding to your skills as a competent pilot. One of the first in-flight skills you will learn is how to control your airplane by using outside visual information. This program introduces the reference points you will use and explains how to combine them with your flight instruments to maintain straight and level flight. As the name implies, straight and level means flying a constant heading at a specific altitude. Airplane control in this situation is divided into two basic elements, pitch control and bank control. Your primary reference for determining pitch information is the view forward to the windshield. This is the normal pitch attitude for level flight. The distance between the nose and the horizon is a measurement of your pitch attitude. As your pitch attitude is increased, the distance between the nose and the horizon becomes smaller. As your pitch attitude is decreased, the horizon moves higher and further away from the nose. Using a point on the windshield that is on or near the horizon is also a good reference for your pitch attitude. Your pitch attitude can also be seen when you look at the wing tips. By comparing the angle of the wing to the horizon, your flight attitude is readily apparent. This is how a nose high pitch attitude looks. And this is a nose low pitch attitude. You can also verify the pitch attitude by referencing the flight instruments. The attitude indicator is an instrument that graphically shows your relationship to the horizon. This bar represents the horizon, and this symbol represents your airplane as viewed from behind. When you are in a level flight attitude, the airplane should rest on the horizon bar. When you increase the pitch attitude, the airplane symbol in the attitude indicator moves above the horizon. In a nose low attitude, the airplane symbol moves downward, duplicating the attitude you see outside. Two other flight instruments you use to cross-check your visual references are the altimeter and the vertical speed indicator, or VSI. The altimeter shows your flying altitude and verifies that you are flying level. Any deviation in your altitude is indicated by movement in the needles. The VSI tells you if you are level, climbing, or descending. It also shows how fast you are climbing or descending. When the needle is at zero, the airplane is in level flight. Now that you have seen how to maintain level flight, let's look at how to keep the airplane flying in a straight line. To maintain straight flight, you must control the bank attitude of your airplane. One way to tell if you are flying straight is to note the position of the horizon in the windshield. You can detect a deviation from straight flight by noting when the horizon tilts in the windshield. In addition, both wingtips should appear to be an equal distance from the horizon. When the wingtips are equal, you are flying straight. As with pitch attitude, you can cross-check your visual cues with the attitude indicator. A turn is shown when the horizon bar tilts in reference to the miniature airplane. When the airplane and the horizon bar are aligned, the airplane is in straight flight. You can also determine if you are flying straight by looking at the heading indicator. A change in heading tells you are banked. Another instrument that detects a bank is the turn coordinator. Unlike the attitude indicator, the turn coordinator does not tell you the angle of bank but rather tells you how quickly you are turning and the direction of the turn. Your ability to maintain straight and level flight by outside visual references will soon become second nature. This skill will help lay the foundation for almost all of the maneuvers you will learn. The same reference points you use to help maintain straight and level flight will be used to help you establish climbs, descents, and turns. Let's begin with a look at how to perform climbs. As with straight and level flight, 
the best visual reference for pitch information is the position of the nose relative to the horizon. To start a climb, smoothly apply back elevator pressure to raise the nose. As the pitch attitude increases, you will experience a decrease in airspeed. For this reason, add power as you increase the pitch to establish the climb. When you have set the proper pitch and power, the airspeed will stabilize at the correct climb speed. Any deviation in pitch will cause a change in airspeed. Decreasing the pitch attitude increases the airspeed, while raising the pitch attitude causes a decrease in airspeed. The flight instruments confirm the climb by a nose-high position on the attitude indicator an increasing altimeter, and a positive rate of climb on the vertical speed indicator. Another visual indicator of a climb is the positive angle created by the wingtip and horizon. In a climb, you need right rudder pressure to overcome the aerodynamic forces that tend to make the airplane turn to the left. If you do not maintain enough rudder pressure, the ball in the inclinometer will move to the right. You can correct this by applying right rudder to bring the aircraft back into coordinated flight. To return to straight and level flight, you need to anticipate the level off before you reach the desired altitude. One method is to lead your desired altitude by 10% of your rate of climb. Here, your rate of climb is 500 feet per minute. 10% of 500 is 50. Based on that rate of climb, you should begin your level off 50 feet before you reach your desired altitude. The references you used for a climb are the same references you will use to establish a descent. Descents are practiced to help you learn how to lose altitude without gaining excessive airspeed. Two types of descents are practiced, those at approach airspeed and those at cruise. To transition from cruise to a descent at approach speed, you must first lose airspeed. To do this, reduce the power and maintain altitude by increasing back elevator pressure. This helps reduce the airspeed to the proper approach speed. When you reach the correct airspeed, lower the nose slightly to maintain that speed. The pitch attitude in this type of descent will be almost level or slightly nose down. Any change in the pitch attitude will cause a corresponding change in your airspeed. To descend at cruise airspeed, lower the nose at the same time you reduce power. As with the previous descent, maintain airspeed by adjusting the pitch attitude. Use the VSI again to calculate when to begin your level off from a descent. Use the same 10% rule described earlier to identify the level off point. You begin a turn by rotating the control wheel in the direction you want to turn. Once you have initiated the bank, it will continue to become steeper until you neutralize the control wheel. Holding neutral control wheel pressure keeps the aircraft in a constant bank angle. When you want to roll out of the turn, use opposite control wheel pressure. Due to the aerodynamic force of adverse yaw, you must use rudder pressure in the direction of the turn to keep the aircraft in coordinated flight. The position of the horizon in the windshield is the best outside reference for the turn. By keeping this reference stationary in the windshield, you will be able to hold the aircraft in a constant bank attitude. A turn to the left looks like this from your viewpoint. Notice how the horizon is positioned in the windshield. A right turn will appear different from a turn to the left. One of the most notable differences is that with the same bank angle, the nose will appear to be higher in a left turn than in a right turn. Another factor that influences the position of the horizon in the windshield is the amount of bank. As it increases, you lose more vertical lift. To compensate, you must increase the pitch attitude to maintain level flight. In addition to your visual references, the airplane's flight instruments can also verify that you are in a turn. The attitude indicator, heading indicator, and turn coordinator will also verify that you are in a turn. When you are rolling out of a left turn to a specific heading, you should lead your rollout by about half your bank angle. In other words, 
If you are in a 30 degree bank and you want to roll out on the heading of 090, you should begin your rollout at 105 degrees or 15 degrees before the desired heading. Now that you've seen how climbs, descents, and turns are performed, let's combine them into a single maneuver. The climbing turn is simply a combination of a turn and a climb. The easiest way to combine these two maneuvers is to start with the climb. First, establish the proper pitch attitude and power setting for climb. Then roll into your desired bank. As you become more proficient, this combination will become more natural and you will be able to do both steps simultaneously. When returning to level flight, you should level off when you reach your altitude and return to wings level flight at your desired heading. To perform a descending turn, first establish your pitch attitude and power, and then roll into your desired angle of bank. As you reach your target altitude, level off, then roll back to a wings level attitude on your desired heading. When you combine the fundamental maneuvers of climbs, descents, and turns, you have the ingredients to perform most flight maneuvers. As your flight training progresses, your instructor will give you the flight controls more often and let you take command of the airplane. At first, a takeoff may seem complicated, but soon you'll perform each takeoff with ease. Before any takeoff, however, you need to complete the pre-takeoff checklist. When you have completed the checklist, contact the tower for takeoff clearance. Then, check the traffic pattern, including the arrival and departure paths for other aircraft. As you taxi onto the runway, align the airplane with the center line and roll forward enough to center the nose wheel. Choose a point that is aligned with the runway. Use it as a reference for maintaining runway heading after you're airborne. This is a good time to turn on your transponder. Also make a quick check of the wind sock to verify the wind direction and speed. To prevent inadvertent use of the brakes during takeoff, slide your feet down so that the balls of your feet are on the lower part of the rudder pedals. Begin the takeoff roll by applying full power. As the airplane accelerates, glance at the engine instruments and the tachometer to confirm that takeoff power is available. If the winds are calm or are directly down the runway, keep the ailerons neutral during the ground roll. As the airplane accelerates, maintain directional control with smooth, positive rudder pedal pressure. Rudder effectiveness will increase as the airspeed increases. As the airspeed approaches liftoff speed, smoothly apply back pressure to rotate the airplane to the takeoff attitude. In most training airplanes, this attitude is similar to the normal climb attitude. Maintain this attitude until the airplane lifts off the runway. With the proper attitude, your airplane will become airborne near the climb speed. You should then adjust this pitch attitude to maintain climb airspeed. Maintain the runway heading until reaching a safe turning altitude. At this point, if you plan to stay in the traffic pattern, initiate a turn to the crosswind leg. If not, depart the area according to local procedures. The previous takeoff discussion assumed that the wind was light or directly down the runway. But what do you do if you have a crosswind? A crosswind tends to push and roll the airplane to the downwind side of the runway. The nose of the airplane will also have a tendency to turn into the wind. This is known as weather veining. Some manufacturers provide crosswind component charts which list the maximum demonstrated crosswind component velocity. Before beginning the takeoff roll, Check the wind sock to determine the wind direction and then position the ailerons into the wind. Full aileron deflection may be required at low speeds when control effectiveness is minimal. As the speed increases and the ailerons become more effective, you may gradually reduce the amount of aileron deflection. 
hold the airplane on the runway until attaining a slightly higher than normal liftoff speed. At this point, establish the normal climb attitude by applying elevator back pressure. When the airplane is airborne, make a slight coordinated turn into the wind to establish a drift correction or crab angle. Once the correction is established, level the wings and maintain the drift correction angle to climb out along the extended runway center line. As you practice takeoffs in various wind conditions, you will become increasingly comfortable with them. One of the most important places you'll apply the skills of straight and level flight, climbs, descents, and turns is in the traffic pattern. Each runway has its own traffic pattern. The traffic pattern is a rectangular course located adjacent to the runway. It is used to keep landing and departing aircraft in an orderly flow and definite path about the airport. Traffic patterns have several segments or legs. The downwind leg runs parallel to the runway and is flown in the opposite direction of landing. Most of this leg is flown in straight and level flight. As you approach the end of the downwind leg, you begin a descent then make a descending turn to the base leg. The base leg is flown in a straight descent. When you near the extended center line of the runway, you make another descending turn. The final leg is a descent along the extended center line until landing. When you take off, the straight ahead climb is called the takeoff or departure leg. Like the final, it is flown along the extended center line of the runway. If you elect to depart the pattern, you can either fly straight out or turn 45 degrees from the departure leg. If you are returning for landing, you can make a climbing turn to the crosswind leg. Notice that all the turns made in this pattern are to the left. This is a standard left-hand traffic pattern recommended by the Aeronautical Information Manual and is the most common type in use. When turns are made to the right, it is called a right-hand traffic pattern. It's used for a number of reasons, such as keeping traffic away from noise-sensitive or dangerous areas. They are also used at airports that have parallel runways. In this situation, the right runway will have a right traffic pattern. This allows for simultaneous approaches and prevents the two runway traffic patterns from overlapping each other. Now that you have an understanding of the basic left-hand traffic pattern, let's look at how to use it. Most entries into the traffic pattern are made by intercepting the downwind leg at a 45 degree angle to the midpoint of the runway. Before you reach the entry point, you should be at the traffic pattern altitude, which is usually 1,000 feet above the airport elevation. As you approach a non-towered airport, monitor the common frequency and look for any traffic that may already be in the area. Look for airplanes that are turning onto downwind from the crosswind leg. In addition, be alert for airplanes that are flying a wider or closer pattern than yours. Also watch for slower airplanes ahead of you that can create a spacing problem. Before entering the downwind leg, announce your intentions on the common frequency. Longmont traffic, Cessna 66091, entering downwind for runway 29er, touch and go, Longmont. Upon intercepting the downwind leg, turn and fly parallel to the runway. Your heading should be approximately 180 degrees from the runway heading. This leg is flown between one half to one mile from the runway. The point on the downwind leg when you are abeam your intended landing spot is where you generally begin your descent. Upon reaching the position approximately 45 degrees from your intended landing spot, check to make sure there is no other traffic already established on the base leg. Then begin your turn. Longmont traffic, Cessna 66091, base, runway 29er, touch and go, Longmont. The base leg is flown with a ground track which is 90 degrees to the runway. Once you're on the base leg, you will decide if your approach needs to be adjusted for wind or traffic. Before you turn on to final, make sure there is no other aircraft established on the final approach path. Longmont traffic, Cessna 66091, final, runway 29er, touch and go, Longmont. When you roll out on final, you should be no closer than one quarter mile from the runway. This leg is flown directly along an extended center line of the runway.
When you depart a runway, you should continue straight out along the extended center line until you are past the departure end of the runway and within 300 feet of the traffic pattern altitude. At this point, you have the option of departing the pattern straight out or making a 45 degree turn away from the departure leg. You can also make a climbing turn to the crosswind leg and return for another landing. In either case, you should announce your intentions. At a tower controlled airport, the controller may specify the type of departure to be flown or you can request a specific type of departure. When you approach a tower controlled airport, you may also be asked to fly a modified traffic pattern to keep the traffic flow smooth. For example, a controller may ask you to enter and report base leg. If so, you should not fly the normal downwind, just the base and final legs of the approach. In this program, you have learned how basic flight maneuvers are used to fly the traffic pattern. These skills are the foundation for learning good approach techniques. Landings are a challenging but rewarding part of your flight training. A well-executed landing demonstrates that you have the ability to perform basic maneuvers, plan approaches, and use proper landing procedures. A typical landing approach in a training aircraft begins when you enter the downwind leg at a 45-degree angle, about mid-field to the runway. Usually, you're at cruise speed. By entering the pattern at mid-field, you have sufficient time to establish a track parallel to the runway and stabilize your attitude and airspeed. Once you're established on downwind and have completed your pre-landing checklist, you can use your heading indicator to help you maintain the proper distance from the runway. You can do this by visualizing the landing runway superimposed over the heading indicator. For example, if 2-9 is the landing runway, you can fly a parallel but opposite course by flying the reciprocal heading of 110 degrees. When at a point opposite the intended landing spot, you normally reduce power and maintain your altitude until the airspeed slows to the initial approach speed. If you intend to use flaps during the approach, lower them to the first increment when the airspeed is within the white arc. The use of flaps allows you to make a steeper approach without increasing airspeed. It also allows you to touch down at a slower speed with a corresponding shorter ground roll. Throughout the approach, use trim to relieve control wheel pressure. When the airplane slows to the approach airspeed, begin a descent. However, maintain the downwind heading until your intended point of landing is approximately 45 degrees behind the aircraft. Then initiate a medium bank turn A glance at your heading indicator will help you determine the proper rollout point. You already know that the base leg is approximately 90 degrees from the runway. So when the visualized runway is 90 degrees off the nose of your aircraft, you are on the correct heading. During the base leg, lower the second increment of flaps if they are being used and adjust the power as necessary to maintain the desired approach path and airspeed. Complete the turn to final so that the airplane is aligned with the runway. At this point, adjust your final approach to intercept the glide path, lower the final increment of flaps, and trim the airplane. If precise control is maintained throughout the landing, the time from power reduction to the touchdown phase will be approximately the same on each approach. During the touchdown phase, you will need to flare or rotate the airplane to the touchdown attitude. At approximately 10 to 20 feet above the runway, initiate the flare by applying gradual back pressure on the control wheel. This decreases the rate of descent and airspeed. As you begin the flare, reduce the power to idle if you haven't already done so. The airplane should reach a zero rate of descent when the main wheels are just off the runway at an airspeed just above a stall. The attitude at touchdown should be very close to the takeoff attitude. The main gear should touch down first with the nose gear clear of the runway. 
After touchdown, maintain back pressure to prevent abrupt nose wheel contact with the runway. After the nose wheel has settled to the runway, gradually relax the back pressure to provide positive nose wheel steering. Throughout your training, you should try to be as consistent as possible to reduce the number of adjustments needed in the traffic pattern. However, you may have to alter the pattern for local procedures or for proper spacing behind other aircraft. If adjustments are required, you can make them in several ways. You may vary power or change the starting point of the descent. You may also extend the downwind or delay flap extension. The earlier you recognize a need for adjustment, the smaller the correction will have to be. To fly a consistent pattern, you must compensate for the effects of wind. In order to do this, you must be able to fly a straight line over the ground, regardless of the wind direction. If there is no wind, tracking a straight line is nothing more than pointing the nose of the airplane in the direction you want to fly. However, if the wind is blowing at an angle to your flight path, it will blow you off course unless you take corrective action. You will need to position the nose of the airplane into the wind just enough to stop the drift. The angle formed between your heading and the ground track is called the crab angle or wind correction angle. How much you crab into the wind will depend on the direction and speed of the wind as well as your direction of flight and airspeed. For example, if the wind is directly down the runway, you must crab the airplane into the wind on the base leg. If you don't apply any correction, the airplane will drift further from the runway, increasing the length of the final approach leg. Strong winds not only affect the base leg, but also have a marked effect on the final approach. When you turn into the wind on final, your ground speed is reduced. However, the rate of descent remains the same. If you make no corrections, touchdown will be short of the intended point. Therefore, use additional power and increase the pitch attitude slightly to maintain the proper glide path and approach. After the correct glide path is established, try to maintain a constant approach angle. In this way, the apparent shape of the runway will remain fixed. A shorter, wider shape indicates you're low on the approach while a longer, narrower shape indicates you are too high. If the approach is high, the normal reaction is to lower the nose and dive the airplane at the intended point of landing. While this may increase the rate of descent slightly, the most pronounced effect is that it will build up excessive airspeed, which significantly reduces the time it takes to descend. Therefore, the airplane will still be high as it approaches the threshold. In addition, the excess speed requires time to dissipate, so the airplane may float well beyond the touchdown point. The proper corrective action is to reduce power, extend additional flaps if available, and maintain the proper approach attitude and airspeed. This should increase the rate of descent without reducing the time to the threshold. Another way to lose altitude is to use a forward slip this is accomplished by lowering the upwind wing and applying sufficient opposite rudder pressure to displace the nose of the aircraft toward the high side of the bank. This increases drag by presenting a larger surface area to the relative wind, with a corresponding increase in the descent rate. If you use a forward slip to lose altitude, establish a normal descent before making the transition to the touchdown phase. Not every one of your landings is going to be perfect. Therefore, you need to know what to do if your approach and landing are something other than normal. For example, if the airspeed is low during the flare, you should delay the power reduction. This will help prevent a rapid loss of altitude with a high sink rate and possibly a hard landing. Conversely, if airspeed is higher than normal, maintain just enough back pressure to keep the airplane in level flight until the excessive airspeed is dissipated. Then continue the flare until the airplane touches down. Flaring too early or too late can also present a problem. 
If you begin the flare too soon, the airplane may stall prior to touchdown. The resulting high sink rate and hard ground contact may result in structural damage to the landing gear and its supporting structures. If you flare too early, add power and stabilize the attitude in a position from which you can make a normal landing. However, if insufficient runway remains, initiate a go-around. If your flare is started too late, you may touch down at a high rate of descent and the airplane may bounce. If the airplane bounces just a few feet in the air and you have plenty of runway left, you might consider placing the airplane back in the landing attitude, adding a little power and letting the airplane settle back onto the runway. Under many circumstances, however, it is best to initiate a go-around by applying full power and adjusting the pitch to the takeoff attitude. Then when you have enough airspeed, make a normal climb out. If the flaps are extended, slowly retract them as the airplane gains altitude and airspeed. As you gain experience, you will develop the ability to analyze and recover from an awkward situation and make a normal landing. But if you're ever in doubt about the outcome, a properly executed go-around is your best bet. An approach and landing in a crosswind is essentially the same as an approach made into a headwind, except that now you need to compensate for the wind drift. Each leg of the traffic pattern may require a crab angle to maintain a straight ground track. Before landing, however, you will use rudder to align the fuselage with the runway centerline. At the same time, lower the upwind wing just enough to maintain the desired ground track. The result is a side slip into the wind, producing a wing-low straight ground track that keeps the airplane over the runway. In this example, the crosswind is from the right. Early in the final approach, turn the airplane's nose into the wind and maintain a straight ground path. Before landing, however, lower the right wing into the wind and apply opposite rudder to align the nose with the center line. Execute the flare exactly as you would if the wind was straight down the runway, except now the upwind main gear will touch down first. As the airplane decelerates, continually increase the aileron deflection to prevent the upwind wing from rising. When you have mastered the procedures presented here, you will be able to land the airplane consistently and safely in crosswind situations. General aviation aircraft are among the safest and most reliable forms of transportation in the world. But like any machine, failures can happen. Your training is designed to introduce you to a variety of simulated systems and equipment malfunctions and give you the tools to cope with that rare occasion when a malfunction occurs. During your practical test, the examiner gives you up to three simulated systems and equipment malfunctions to test how you analyze the situation and to see if you take the appropriate action to resolve the problem. The list of possible systems and equipment malfunctions varies from a partial or complete engine failure to smoke or fire in the engine compartment. Typically, procedures for emergency situations can be found in your POH or AFM. However, it is impossible to cover every failure or malfunction. If your POH or AFM does not have procedures for a specific emergency, such as an asymmetrical flap extension, you must rely on previous experience, good judgment, and a knowledge of the manufacturer's published emergency procedures to form an appropriate plan of action. Remember, as in any emergency situation, your first priority is to fly the aircraft. You must remain calm, clearly assess the emergency, then respond quickly and accurately to fix the problem. While many emergency checklists are committed to memory because your response must be instantaneous, other situations are less critical. In this case, you have time to refer to the POH or AFM to determine the appropriate course of action. An example of an emergency that is typically not covered in a POH or AFM is the partial loss of engine power. 
The partial loss of power could be the result of any number of factors, including a mechanical breakage or stoppage of the throttle control, or even undetected ice. Depending on the degree of power loss and to what extent the performance of the aircraft has been compromised, you may have several different options regarding your course of action. If your aircraft is capable of maintaining altitude or climbing, you can continue your flight to the nearest suitable airport while monitoring engine instruments and looking out for an emergency landing site should the need arise. You should maintain at least best glide speed while you attempt to restore full power to the engine. This may include applying carburetor heat, readjusting the mixture, checking the fuel selector switch, checking the magneto switch, and making sure the primer is in and locked. If you are unable to restore power, continue flying until you reach a suitable landing site. If your performance is severely diminished, you may have no other choice than to execute an off-airport landing. You should follow the emergency landing checklist outlined in your aircraft POH. It's a good idea to discuss emergency procedures for a variety of possible situations with your flight instructor. Your instructor can help you develop guidelines for systems and equipment malfunctions that are not covered in your AFM or POH. Reviewing emergency procedures on a regular basis and repeated practice with your flight instructor will also help prepare you for a real system malfunction or failure. In the unlikely event of a systems or equipment malfunction, your preparation can be the difference between confusion and a favorable outcome. Engine failures in today's general aviation airplanes are extremely unlikely. Chances are you will never have to perform an emergency approach and landing, but you should always be prepared for an unexpected emergency. Let's take a look at how you can do this. The emergency procedures section in the pilot's operating handbook is your official source of information on how to handle an emergency. You need to review the emergency procedures in the POH often enough to ensure that they come to mind quickly. For an extra margin of safety, you should always practice emergency approach and landing procedures with an instructor. Remember that emergency approach and landing procedures may vary slightly between different airplanes, so you should consult the POH for the airplane you fly. Now, let's take a look at some general emergency approach and landing procedures. The first thing to do, if you sense a loss of engine power, is establish the best glide speed. This speed can be found in the POH. If you fly at the best glide speed, you will minimize altitude loss, giving you more time to deal with the emergency. Flying at any speed faster or slower than best glide will result in a greater rate of descent. To help maintain the best glide speed, use the trim to relieve control pressures. The next step is to locate a suitable landing spot. If an airport is not located close by, look for an open pasture, sod farm, or hard packed dirt field. Some roads make good landing spots. However, be aware of hazards such as cars and power lines. Avoid fields that are plowed or have ditches and other obstructions. You should also take the wind direction and speed into consideration when choosing a landing spot. A shorter field with a strong headwind may be a better choice than a longer field that has a crosswind or tailwind. After you have selected a good landing spot, go ahead and make a turn toward it. Make sure the spot you've selected is close enough to glide to comfortably. It's better to circle over your selected site if you need to lose altitude. This will also aid you in picking out any obstacles such as potholes, power lines, or ditches. If you have time while gliding down to your landing spot, you should attempt to figure out what's wrong with the engine. In case ice has formed in the carburetor, Pull the carburetor heat to the on position. Verify that the fuel selector is in the both position. Adjust the mixture. Make sure the ignition switch is in the both position and check the primer to verify it is in and locked. If the engine doesn't start, continue with your emergency approach. If you have time after an attempted restart, try to notify someone of your emergency. Set your transponder to 7700. If you are in contact with ATC, 
call on the currently assigned frequency and advise them of your situation. If not in contact with ATC, make a radio call on 121.5. Mayday, 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 52241, Cessna 172, engine failure, force landing five miles southeast of Kiowa, one on board. If possible, try to set up your emergency approach just like a normal approach with downwind, base, and final legs. Your downwind position should be about 180 degrees from where you want to touch down. Once you are assured of making your selected landing site, begin to secure the airplane to reduce the risk of fire. Cut the fuel to the engine by bringing the mixture to idle cutoff. Turn the fuel selector to the off position. Then turn the ignition switch off. Lower the flaps as required. And then turn the master switch off. Unlatch the doors prior to touchdown to make it easier to exit the airplane if it is damaged during the landing. In a real emergency, be prepared to touch down on a surface that is much rougher than what you're used to. Hold back pressure on the yoke to lower the nose wheel slowly. This will reduce the chance of the airplane flipping over if the surface is soft. Apply the brakes as needed. On a short field, you may need to apply the brakes heavily. Practice emergency approaches will typically end by going around once you are assured of making the selected landing spot. Try and make your practice approaches as realistic as possible. Look for a spot that you could really land on and concentrate on making a good approach. Being prepared is the best line of defense in an emergency situation. An emergency approach and landing is a skill you may never have to use, but it sure pays to know how to do it well. As you continue your training, you will be introduced to more advanced flight training, including maneuvering during slow flight. Slow flight can be thought of as any airspeed below normal cruise. However, during your training, slow flight will typically be conducted at an airspeed where any significant reduction in speed or power, or an increase in load factor, results in a stall indication. You should practice maneuvering during slow flight to develop a feel for the controls at various speeds and power settings. And to learn the relationship of power and pitch to altitude and airspeed. Before you begin the maneuver, check for other air traffic by clearing the area. There's traffic at 10 o'clock. Let's turn right about 90 degrees. To transition from cruise flight, first apply carburetor heat and then reduce the power to several hundred RPM below that used to maintain cruise altitude. Remember, as you decrease the airspeed, you must also increase the angle of attack to maintain altitude. During this time, use trim to remove control pressures. When the airspeed approaches the desired value, increase power to hold the assigned airspeed and altitude. As power is added, smooth application of the right rudder is required to overcome the airplane's left turning tendencies. Then, when attitude, airspeed, and altitude stabilize, trim the airplane to relieve control wheel pressures. The attitude indicator confirms the airplane's high pitch condition, while the altimeter and the vertical speed indicator verify that you're level. At these slow speeds, control response will feel sluggish, although greater control deflections may be needed to achieve a change in flight attitude. You should apply gentle control pressures. Using abrupt movements could result in a stall. While operating in slow flight, any attempt to change altitude solely through the use of control pressures will not achieve the desired results. For example, if you attempt to climb by just increasing the pitch attitude, the airspeed will decrease and the airplane will stall. The correct procedure is to apply power, then adjust the pitch attitude as necessary to maintain the desired airspeed. On the other hand, if you decrease the pitch to descend without reducing power, 
the airspeed will increase above that desired. The proper way to descend is to reduce power and adjust the pitch attitude. Climbing and descending in slow flight demonstrates that power controls your altitude when you maintain the same airspeed. To turn the airplane during slow flight, the same procedures used at higher speeds are still applicable. However, in slow flight, you must add power to maintain altitude. Whenever you make a turn during slow flight, use shallow bank angles and smooth coordinated control wheel movements to prevent stalling the airplane during the turn. Your instructor will also have you practice slow flight with various flap settings so you can see the different attitude and power requirements for each phase of flight. To return to cruise flight, apply full power and slowly decrease the pitch attitude as the airplane accelerates. As the airspeed increases, retract the flaps if extended. After reaching your cruise airspeed, adjust power and trim for cruising flight. Maneuvering during slow flight provides you with a better feel for the airplane in various flight conditions. This will help prepare you for several aspects of flight training, including stalls and landings. When maneuvering during slow flight, you are flying very near the stall speed of the airplane. But you don't necessarily have to be flying at slow air speeds for a stall to occur. A stall can happen at any airspeed and in any flight attitude. This program will explain how to recognize an approaching stall with the power off and the procedures for recovering from a power off stall. Simply stated, a stall occurs when the critical angle of attack is exceeded causing the smooth airflow over the wing surface to break away. This results in a loss of lift. You practice stalls for two reasons. First, they acquaint you with the stall warnings and handling characteristics of your airplane as it approaches a stall. And second, they develop your skills so you can recover from an inadvertent stall quickly and efficiently with a minimal loss of altitude. Stalls are practiced at an altitude that will allow you to complete the stall recovery no lower than 1,500 feet above the ground. Before starting the maneuver, clear the area. Then, reduce power and slow the airplane to the normal glide airspeed. As the airspeed enters the white arc, extend the flaps to the setting used during a normal approach and establish the landing attitude. Once stabilized, smoothly raise the nose to an attitude which will induce a stall. To help determine when your airplane is approaching a stall, there are several cues you should be familiar with. One of these is the decreasing sound as the airspeed decreases. Another cue is the stall warning, which begins around 5 to 10 knots above the stall. This warning may be either a light on the instrument panel, a warning horn, buffeting of the airplane, mushy controls, or a combination of these. As the airplane nears a stall, control effectiveness decreases, and you may feel the airplane begin to shake slightly or buffet. During this time, you still have full control of the airplane, meaning you can still maintain attitude, heading, and altitude. This stage of flight is sometimes called the incipient stage of a stall, or an imminent stall. If recovery is not made at this point, a stall occurs. In a stall, the wings no longer sustain the lift necessary to maintain flight. Once the critical angle of attack is exceeded, the nose will pitch downward. Initiate the recovery by smoothly reducing the angle of attack as you apply full power. As you add power, you'll need to increase right rudder pressure to keep the ball centered in the turn coordinator. Then, use the flap retraction procedures specified by the manufacturer. As the airspeed begins to increase following the recovery, gently establish a climb attitude. If this isn't done properly, and you increase the pitch attitude too quickly, a secondary stall could occur. 
Conversely, waiting too long to establish a climb attitude could result in excessive speed and loss of altitude. The correct procedure is to raise the nose smoothly to the proper pitch attitude and climb at the airspeed recommended by the manufacturer. Once you've achieved proficiency in straight ahead stalls, your instructor will have you do power off stalls while in a turn. You will use the same procedures as in the previous maneuvers, except you will enter a coordinated turn of approximately 20 degrees before increasing back pressure on the control wheel. Recovery is much like the straight ahead stall, except that you must level the wings. However, don't level the wings until you've reduced the angle of attack and have added full power. Then, roll the wings level by using coordinated ailerons and rudder pressure. If you're using flaps, they should be retracted, as specified by the manufacturer. Practicing stalls is not meant to increase your ability to stall an airplane, but to help you recognize the onset of a stall and how to prevent it. Or, if one does occur, what procedures to use to minimize the loss of altitude. In addition, by practicing a power-off stall, you'll get a better idea of what can happen during an approach to landing if your attention is diverted from flying the airplane. A power-on stall can occur if you attempt to lift off and climb out at an airspeed below that normally used for takeoff, or if you use too high of a pitch attitude when trying to clear an obstacle. As with power-off stalls, learning to recognize the sensations and visual cues that precede a power-on stall will help you avoid accidentally entering into one. Remember, you should practice stalls at an altitude that allows recovery at least 1,500 feet above the ground. After the area is cleared, reduce power. And as the airplane is slowing to lift off speed, lower the flaps if appropriate. As the airspeed decreases, increase back pressure to maintain your altitude. When the airspeed has decreased to near lift off speed, Simultaneously add back pressure as you advance the power to the takeoff or climb setting recommended by the manufacturer. The power on stall is initially performed with the wings level, but to simulate a turn after takeoff, your instructor will also have you enter a 20 degree bank to the left or right. Remember, as you add power and continue to increase back pressure, you must compensate for the airplane's left turning tendencies by keeping the airplane in coordinated flight. The pitch attitude for a power on stall will be much higher than for a power off stall. But like the power off stall, you will feel the characteristic buffet just before it occurs. Since you still have control of the airplane at this point, recovery from the near stall condition can be made by decreasing the pitch attitude as you apply any remaining power. Then the wings should be rolled level. When there is no danger of a secondary stall, return to straight and level flight or a climb by retracting the flaps if they were used. However, if you don't recover at that point, the airplane will stall and the pitch attitude will decrease abruptly because of the excessive nose high attitude. If the airplane is not in coordinated flight when the stall occurs, one wing may stall first, causing a sudden roll as the nose pitches down. If the airplane is slipping to the inside of the turn, the upper wing will stall first. In this case, the airplane might roll in the opposite direction, lessening the bank angle. Conversely, if the airplane is skidding to the outside of the turn, the lower wing will tend to stall first. This results in a steeper bank. If the airplane is properly coordinated, it will pitch down with approximately the same amount of bank. Therefore, you should work to keep the aircraft in coordinated flight as you practice any power on stalls.
As your stall training progresses, you'll be introduced to several aspects of stall spin awareness. Although you are not required to demonstrate spin recovery on your private pilot practical test, you are required to have a thorough understanding of spins and spin recovery techniques. Your training in this area consists of both ground and flight instruction. The ground training portion includes instruction in the areas of stall awareness, spin entry, spins, and spin recovery techniques. Then, as your flight training progresses, further emphasis is placed on stall recognition and recovery, and realistic distractions are introduced during flight at critically slow airspeeds. It's important to remember that actual spin training is not required and under no circumstances should you practice spins or spin recovery techniques without a certified flight instructor on board. Accelerated maneuver stalls are a variation of power on and power off turning stalls. Although not included in the private pilot PTS, your instructor may demonstrate how an airplane can stall at higher air speeds due to the additional load factors created by a steep turn. For example, in a 45 degree level turn, the airplane's effective weight is 1.4 times greater than in level flight. This means that if the normal stall speed for a particular airplane in straight and level flight with flaps up is 50 knots, it will stall at 59 knots in a 45 degree level turn. Before beginning an accelerated stall, clear the area. Then verify that the airspeed of the airplane is below the published maneuvering speed. This will avoid placing high structural loads on the airplane during the maneuver. Next, roll the airplane into a level bank of approximately 45 degrees and firmly increase back pressure on the control wheel to initiate a stall. Normally, you will recover at the first indication of a stall by releasing back pressure while simultaneously adding full power. Then, use the flight controls to keep the airplane coordinated as you level the wings. A crossed control stall is most likely to occur during a poorly planned and executed turn from base to final approach and is often the result of overshooting the extended runway center line during the turn to final. Even though flight proficiency in a crossed control stall is not required, it will be demonstrated to you by your flight instructor. The important thing to understand is not how to perform the crossed control stall, but to be able to recognize its onset and the procedures necessary for a safe recovery. A crossed control stall will occur when you apply aileron pressure in one direction, rudder pressure in the opposite direction, and use excessive elevator back pressure. Stall should be practiced at an altitude that will allow you to safely complete the stall recovery no lower than 1,500 feet above ground level. For this demonstration, we'll check the area for other traffic. Reduce the power. Then maintain altitude until the airspeed approaches the normal glide speed. Flaps should not be lowered during this demonstration because of the possibility of exceeding the airplane's limitations. Once the glide attitude and airspeed have been stabilized, roll into a medium bank turn to simulate a final approach turn with an overshoot to the center line of the runway. Continue the turn while applying full rudder input in the direction of the turn. Maintain the bank by applying opposite aileron pressure to stop the overbanking tendencies while slowly increasing back pressure on the elevator to keep the nose from lowering. When the airplane stalls, release the pressure on the flight controls and then increase the power as necessary to return to straight and level flight. In a crossed control stall, the airplane may stall with little or no warning. The nose may pitch down and the inside wing suddenly drop. The airplane may continue to roll into an inverted attitude. This is usually the beginning of a spin and can be very dangerous at lower altitudes. Early recognition of the characteristics of a crossed control stall is very important. 
because recovery may be impossible due to the altitude needed for a safe recovery. The demonstration of an elevator trim stall will show you what can happen when full power is applied during a go-around from a normal landing approach, a simulated forced landing, or immediately after takeoff with an improperly set takeoff trim setting. Whenever we're practicing stalls, John, one thing you've got to remember according to the PTS is that we must recover from a stall no lower than 1,500 feet AGL. Even though flight proficiency in an elevator trim stall is not required, it will be demonstrated to you by your flight instructor. The important thing to understand is not how to perform the elevator trim stall, but to be able to recognize its onset and the procedures necessary for a safe recovery. You will also learn the importance of making smooth power changes, how to overcome strong trim forces, and how to maintain positive control of the airplane in a go-around environment. After clearing the area for other traffic, slowly reduce the power. Lower one half to full flaps. Then set the power to idle. Maintain altitude until the airplane slows to the approach glide speed. Once established in a glide, simulating the final approach path to the runway, smoothly advance the throttle to the maximum allowable power as you would in a go-around. To recover from the approaching stall, apply positive forward control pressure to lower the nose maintaining directional control with aileron and rudder pressure. Maintain forward pressure until a normal climb airspeed and attitude can be established. Then retrim the aircraft to remove excessive control pressures. It is imperative that a stall does not occur when full power is applied during a go-around from a normal landing approach, a simulated forced landing, or immediately after takeoff with an improperly set takeoff trim setting because the amount of pitch change and altitude needed for a recovery may be inadequate. From this demonstration, it is apparent that stall recognition is important and prompt recovery procedures should be implemented immediately to prevent a fully developed stall condition. After gaining proficiency in stalls, you will be introduced to more advanced maneuvers, such as constant altitude steep turns. This maneuver consists of a constant altitude 360 degree turn with a bank angle of 40 to 50 degrees. The practical test standard, PTS, requires that you be able to turn in both directions. Steep turns help you develop coordination of pitch and bank while maintaining altitude at a constant power setting. They also develop smoothness, orientation, and division of attention. Before you enter the maneuver, make sure there is no conflicting traffic in the area. To maintain orientation, select a reference point parallel to your flight path. Section lines, roads, or a prominent landmark on the horizon are all good reference points that help you determine the starting and ending points of the maneuver. Begin the maneuver with the airplane stabilized in straight and level flight at an altitude that will allow you to complete the maneuver no lower than 1,500 feet above ground level. Your airspeed should be at the manufacturer's recommended speed, or if none is given, at or below maneuvering speed. Roll into a 45 degree bank turn with coordinated aileron and rudder pressure. This bank should be smoothly established at a moderate rate without rushing. As the bank steepens, you will need to increase back pressure and add power to maintain level flight. If you do not maintain the proper pitch attitude, the aircraft may enter a steep descending spiral. The natural reaction in this case is to increase control wheel back pressure, which only tightens the descending spiral and increases the possibility of an accelerated stall. If you're losing altitude and the pitch attitude is low, decrease the angle of bank slightly 
Then bring the pitch attitude back up to level flight and return to the desired bank angle. When you roll out of a steep turn to a designated heading or to your reference point, use the same procedures as for shallower banks, but initiate the rollout approximately 20 degrees before reaching the desired heading. As the bank decreases, reduce back pressure to maintain altitude and adjust the power to return to cruise. If you use trim during the turn, the last step is to relieve control pressures by re-trimming the airplane. As you gain proficiency in steep turns, you may learn to continue from one turn to another without hesitation between the two. The back pressure held in the first turn is reduced during the rollout, then reapplied as the angle of bank increases in the turn to the opposite direction. During this maneuver, you will most likely experience an overbanking tendency. This is due to the wing on the outside of the turn traveling a greater distance than the inside wing. Since it is traveling farther, it has a faster airflow. As more air passes over an airfoil, more lift is produced. This increase in lift on the outside wing causes the airplane to roll beyond the desired bank angle. To counter this tendency, you must apply slight aileron pressure opposite the direction of turn. In addition, because the tail of the aircraft is located aft of the center of gravity of the airplane, it does not track in the same arc. To streamline the fuselage, you need to apply rudder pressure. As you practice steep turns, you will begin to gain confidence in controlling the airplane while your attention is diverted outside. Developing this important skill helps you progress easily into the more advanced ground reference maneuvers. The ground reference maneuvers in this program are designed to help develop your ability to compensate for wind drift and control the airplane while your attention is diverted outside. Many of the skills you'll learn in these maneuvers can be applied to your routine flying and improve your feel for the airplane. The first step in executing any ground reference maneuver is to determine from which direction the wind is blowing. This can be done by noting the position of the wind sock at the departure airport, the runway in use, or the direction the wind is blowing trees and dust. Another method you can use is to fly a 360 degree constant airspeed, constant bank turn. The difference between your starting and ending points gives you the general idea of the wind direction. Let's begin with a look at rectangular courses. The procedures you use to fly a traffic pattern are very similar to those you'll use to fly a rectangular course. The exception is that you'll fly at a constant altitude between 600 and 1,000 feet AGL. As the name implies, you'll be flying a rectangle around reference lines on the ground. The objective is to maintain an equal distance from the boundary throughout the maneuver. This distance should be about one quarter to one half mile. Ideally, one leg of the pattern should be directly downwind. This allows you to fly one segment with the wind, another directly into the wind, and two legs with a crosswind. The preferred entry to the rectangular course is on the downwind leg in straight and level flight. At this point, the ground speed is higher than on any other leg in the pattern, and little or no crab angle is needed. When you're opposite the corner of the field, start the turn to crosswind. Since the ground speed is high, the initial bank angle is steep. But to maintain a constant distance from the field, the bank is gradually reduced as your ground speed slows during the turn. The turn to the crosswind leg is completed so that a crab angle is established into the wind. Maintain a crab angle that will allow you to fly a straight line at an equal distance from the field. The turn to upwind is begun when you're opposite the end of the field. During the turn, your ground speed slows as you head into the wind. Therefore, the angle of bank gradually decreases. This leg is flown directly into the wind, so no crab angle is required 
and your ground speed is slow. During the turn to the next leg, your ground speed gradually increases. This means the angle of bank must increase to maintain a constant distance from the field. On this crosswind segment, the wind tends to drift the airplane toward the field. Therefore, the turn is completed so that a crab angle is established into the wind. Maintain this crab angle until you reach the end of the crosswind leg. As you turn downwind, your ground speed increases. This means the bank angle needs to increase gradually throughout the turn to maintain a constant distance. Your ability to compensate for the wind during a turn is an important element of flying a rectangular course properly. S-turns are a series of alternating left and right 180 degree turns across a reference line on the ground. During each turn, a constant radius is maintained by varying the angle of bank to compensate for wind drift. To begin, select a road, fence, railroad, or section line which lies perpendicular to the wind and is long enough for a series of turns. Approach the road on a downwind heading at an altitude between 600 and 1,000 feet AGL. When you're directly over the road, begin your turn. At the entry point, your ground speed is high, so the bank angle is steep. As the turn continues, your ground speed gradually slows. This requires a decrease in the bank angle to maintain a constant radius. As you approach the road, the bank angle continues to decrease until you are in straight and level flight over the road. Begin a turn in the opposite direction without delay. Since the ground speed is low, the initial bank is shallow. In the second half of the S-turn, the airplane is turning from an upwind to a downwind heading. Ground speed increases as you progress, so you'll need to increase the bank angle to maintain a constant radius. The steepest bank occurs as you near the 180 degree point. Once again, you should be in level flight when you're directly over and perpendicular to the road. If the maneuver will continue, immediately roll into the next turn. In turns around a point, you'll fly a constant radius circle around a prominent reference point on the ground. You'll need to adjust the bank angle throughout the maneuver to compensate for wind drift. The point you select should be easy to distinguish, yet small enough to present a precise reference. Like most ground reference maneuvers, the entry is flown on a downwind heading between 600 and 1,000 feet AGL. You should fly to one side of the reference point at the distance you want to maintain throughout the turn. When you're opposite the reference point, roll into the initial bank at a fairly rapid rate. Since you're flying downwind, the ground speed is high and the angle of bank is at the steepest point in the maneuver. During the first half of the turn, the bank angle is gradually reduced as your ground speed decreases. This allows you to maintain a constant distance from the reference point. As you reach the upwind side of the maneuver, the ground speed is low and the angle of bank is at its shallowest point. Your ground speed begins to increase as you continue toward the downwind side of the maneuver. This requires a gradual increase in the bank angle to maintain a constant radius. You may need to fly around the point several times to get a good feel for the wind, varying bank angles, and the proper distance from the reference point. It is also a good idea to practice turns to the right as well as turns to the left. Most of your takeoffs and landings will be made at airports with lengthy, hard-surfaced, smooth runways. However, you might at some time have to land and take off from short runways or rough or soft surfaces over obstacles, or you might experience any combination of these. The efficiency of your airplane depends on your ability to employ the techniques of maximum performance takeoffs and landings. Although we will discuss short and soft field takeoffs and landings separately, 
you will find that many times both conditions exist at the same location. When this happens, you might need to use the techniques for both. Let's begin by looking at short field procedures. Short field takeoffs begin with a check of the performance charts to see if your airplane is capable of a safe takeoff under existing conditions. This is extremely important as density altitude increases. Besides considering the runway length and takeoff roll, during training you normally assume that there is a 50-foot obstacle to be cleared after takeoff. This requires additional performance calculations to ensure clearance. The pre-takeoff checklist is basically the same as the one you use for a normal takeoff, except that you set the flaps as recommended by the airplane manufacturer to achieve a maximum performance climb. If runway length is critical, position your airplane so that you can use all of the available runway. Then, align the airplane with the center of the runway and initiate the takeoff by holding the brakes and applying full power. While this does not necessarily shorten the ground run, it does help you be sure that the engine is running smoothly. During the takeoff roll, allow the airplane to accelerate in a level attitude with the elevator in the neutral position for minimum drag. Shortly before reaching the best angle of climb airspeed, positively rotate the airplane. Maintain this attitude until the airplane has cleared all obstacles. If no obstacles are in the departure path, or after you have cleared the obstacles, Adjust the airplane's pitch to the normal climb attitude and slowly retract the flaps. You must also apply special techniques when landing on a short field. The objective is to touch down near the approach end in a full stall attitude. For training, you should assume that the approach is over a 50-foot obstacle. Your preparation for the landing begins on the downwind leg of the traffic pattern where you slow the airplane to pattern speed and extend the flaps to the first position. Apply the remaining flaps as you continue through the base leg and after the turn to final. Reduce the airspeed progressively to that recommended by the manufacturer for short field landings. Ideally, you should conduct the final approach at a constant glide angle, airspeed, and power setting. You may need to make minor adjustments to pitch and power to maintain a stabilized approach. If you maintain the proper approach configuration, the airplane will not float above the runway and you will touch down close to the stall speed. To produce the shortest ground roll after landing, you should make sure the throttle is closed. Apply back pressure to the control wheel. Retract the flaps. And apply firm and even braking action. Typically, your initial soft field training will take place on a hard surfaced runway. Regardless of the type of practice surface used, soft field techniques are a valuable part of your flight training. If possible, complete your pre-takeoff checklist on a firm surface in an area free from loose sand and gravel. This helps to prevent propeller and airframe damage caused by flying debris. Set the flaps for the maximum performance takeoff as recommended by the manufacturer. With the checklist completed, you're ready to taxi. If the taxi area is soft, hold back pressure on the control wheel to keep the nose wheel from sinking into the ground. You should also add a slight amount of power to help keep the airplane moving. Try to clear the approach area while taxiing in order to keep the airplane moving directly from taxi to the takeoff roll. As you increase power during the soft field takeoff, you'll have to apply right rudder pressure to overcome torque, P-factor, and spiraling slipstream. In order to prevent the nose wheel from sinking into the soft runway during the takeoff roll, you need to transfer the airplane's weight from the landing gear to the wings as quickly and smoothly as possible. This is accomplished by holding back pressure on the control wheel and accelerating the airplane in a nose-high attitude. As the weight on the nose wheel is reduced, nose wheel steering becomes less effective. However, you will still have directional control because of the slipstream flowing over the rudder. You can relax some of the control wheel back pressure as speed builds up and the elevator becomes more responsive. As you lift off the runway, lower the pitch attitude and accelerate in ground effect to the best angle of climb airspeed before initiating a climb out. 
When all obstacles have been cleared, accelerate to the best rate of climb airspeed. Slowly retract the flaps and continue your climb. As you enter the traffic pattern and complete the checklist, you need to concentrate on performing a stabilized approach with a smooth, soft touchdown. Using full flaps during a soft fill landing will help you touch down at a low airspeed. They should be applied smoothly during the downwind, base, and final legs of the approach. Your objective for a soft fill landing is to transfer the airplane's weight from the wings to the landing gear as smoothly and gently as possible. The final approach airspeed that you use at a soft field is normally the same as that used for short field landings. The descent angle will depend on whether or not any obstructions are located in your approach path. The flare and touchdown require precise pitch and power control. If runway length is not a problem, you might want to carry a small amount of power during the flare out. Then, as you near the surface, smoothly raise the nose of the airplane to an attitude which resembles the climb attitude. In this way, the airplane will settle onto the ground as gently as possible. Maintain this power and elevator back pressure during the rollout to help keep the nose wheel off the ground as the airplane decelerates. Deceleration on a soft surface is generally quite rapid. Therefore, braking, other than that required for directional control, is usually not needed. Although you need special techniques when operating to and from short and soft fields, your ability to properly execute maximum performance takeoffs and landings will increase your flying enjoyment. The skills that you acquire will not only make you a safer pilot, but will enable you to use the many airports not serviced by long, hard-surfaced runways. During VFR flight, you control the airplane's
altitude displacement. The actual rate of climb or descent, however, may take a little longer to register. Another instrument that indicates a change in altitude is the airspeed indicator. Once you've established a constant power setting, airspeed fluctuations signify pitch changes that will result in altitude variations. For example, if pitch increases, the airspeed begins to decrease. If airspeed increases, pitch has decreased and you will lose altitude. When you notice a change in altitude, you'll need to correct the pitch attitude to return to the original altitude. You should make corrections by referring to the attitude indicator and monitoring the altimeter to complete the adjustment back to level flight. As a general rule, if the altitude deviation is less than 100 feet, you should correct the pitch attitude without changing power. When the deviation is greater than 100 feet, you should combine a pitch change with an appropriate power adjustment. Let's look now at the other half of straight and level flight, maintaining a constant heading. The instruments used for bank control are the attitude indicator, heading indicator, and turn coordinator. The attitude indicator instantly shows any change in bank and gives a general picture of bank attitude. If you bank to the left or to the right, you get a direct indication of the movement on the attitude indicator. During coordinated flight, a turn is also shown on the heading indicator. Generally, if the heading remains constant, the wings are level. A shallow bank is shown by a slow heading change, while a rapid change signifies a steeper bank. Another instrument which provides an indirect indication of a bank is the turn coordinator. Your heading will remain constant when the wings of the miniature airplane are level and the ball is centered. You will be in a bank and subsequent turn when the wings of the miniature airplane roll to either side. With an understanding of how straight and level flight is performed, let's look at how climbs are made by instrument reference. To enter a climb from cruise airspeed, you need to raise the nose of the airplane. Monitor the attitude indicator as you increase the pitch attitude above the horizon reference line. You must also increase power to sustain the climb. Do this either simultaneously with the pitch change or after the pitch has been established and the airspeed approaches the desired climb speed. When the airspeed stabilizes, trim the airplane. During a stabilized climb, any change in airspeed signifies that the pitch attitude has changed. To correct the pitch, use the attitude indicator. Your actual rate of climb depends on the density altitude, power setting, and aircraft weight. But the VSI can provide an indirect indication of pitch changes when it increases or decreases. In a climb, you maintain directional control the same as in straight and level flight with one exception. The ball in the turn coordinator is scanned to ensure that you are applying enough right rudder pressure. The level off from an instrument climb is performed the same as with outside visual references. As you approach your desired altitude, begin the level off by leading the altitude by 10% of the vertical speed. For example, if you are climbing at 500 feet per minute, lead the level off altitude by 50 feet. To level off, apply smooth control pressure until the miniature airplane on the attitude indicator is aligned with the horizon reference line. As you establish a level flight attitude, the vertical speed indicator will move slowly toward zero. The altimeter needle will slow its upward movement and the airspeed indicator will move toward cruise airspeed. To complete the transition from climb to cruise, relax the right rudder pressure you held during the climb to maintain the planned heading, reduce power to cruise, and trim the airplane. With the airplane established back at straight and level, let's go ahead and look at how to descend by instrument reference. 
To enter a constant airspeed descent, establish the desired airspeed by reducing power to the predetermined setting and maintain altitude. As you reach the desired airspeed, lower the pitch to maintain the airspeed and trim for the descent. Correct any deviation in airspeed by adjusting the pitch attitude. Use the bank control instruments to maintain directional control during the descent. As you approach your planned altitude, begin the level off by leading the altitude by about 10% of the vertical speed. Raise the pitch attitude to level flight. Then increase the power while maintaining directional control. When stabilized in cruise, retrim the airplane. The next maneuver we'll look at is performing a turn. All turns by instrument reference are made at a standard rate of 3 degrees per second. When the miniature airplane in the turn coordinator is aligned with the reference mark, you are in a standard rate turn. To enter a turn, establish a bank by referring to the attitude indicator. As you become familiar with your airplane, you'll learn the angle of bank that produces the standard rate turn at a given true airspeed. As the turn is established, you'll need to raise the nose slightly to offset the loss of vertical lift during the bank. Then, check the turn coordinator to ensure you are in a coordinated standard rate turn. If the turn is not standard, Make a slight bank adjustment on the attitude indicator and confirm the change on the turn coordinator. The altimeter and the vertical speed indicator must be included in your scan to assure that the altitude is being maintained. During the turn, monitor the heading indicator to determine the progress toward the desired heading. To allow for the rollout, Lead the heading by the number of degrees equal to one half of the bank angle. For example, if you are in a 15 degree bank, start the rollout about eight degrees before the desired heading. As you return to wings level, release the back pressure held during the turn and continue your instrument scan. Part of your attitude instrument training will include recognition of and recovery from unusual or critical flight attitudes. Your instructor will have you close your eyes and let go of the controls. The airplane will be maneuvered to simulate an unusual attitude that could result from turbulence, preoccupation with cabin duties, disorientation, or erroneous instrument interpretation. When you're instructed to take the controls, you need to evaluate the situation immediately and make a proper recovery. For example, the approach to a climbing stall is signified by a high pitch attitude and decreasing airspeed. This situation requires you to lower the nose toward level flight while immediately adding full power and leveling the wings. Conversely, if the pitch attitude is low and the airspeed increasing, You'll need to reduce power to prevent excessive airspeed, adjust the wings to level, and then raise the pitch to a straight and level flight attitude. Your initial training in attitude instrument flying does not qualify you to fly in IFR conditions without an instrument rating. However, it does provide you with basic emergency skills if you inadvertently lose outside visual references. It also helps you interpret the instruments more effectively during VFR conditions. Night flying can offer some of the most exciting and enjoyable flying that you will ever experience. At night, there is usually less traffic, the air is generally smoother, and the communication frequencies are less congested. However, because your vision is less sharp at night, you need to pay close attention to numerous items when planning and making a night flight. Safe night flying begins with careful and thorough flight planning. Because of the visual limitations of night flying, 
chart references, and the altimeter may be your only reliable means of determining altitudes sufficient for terrain and obstacle clearance. You should also have available the adjacent chart if your route of flight will take you near the edge of the sectional. By referring to the adjacent chart, you'll be able to identify distant cities or landmarks not found on the primary chart. Your preparation for a night flight should also include a complete weather briefing, including a study of the available weather reports and forecasts. When reviewing this material, it is important that you pay close attention to the temperature dew point spread. A small spread is a good indication of the possibility of the formation of ground fog. Because aircraft drift is very difficult to detect during takeoffs and landings at night, it's a good idea to also pay close attention to the wind direction and speed. Another important consideration is that under no circumstances should a night VFR flight be made under poor or marginal weather conditions. As you continue with your planning, it's recommended that you check the availability of en route and destination airport lighting systems along your route of flight. This information can be found on aeronautical charts, and in the airport facility directory. It's also important that you check the status of these lights by reviewing the pertinent notices to airmen. Once your planning is finished, you're ready to pre-flight the airplane. Remember that before any flight at night, you should allow at least 30 minutes for your eyes to adapt to the darkness. To ensure that you completely check the airplane prior to departure, use a reliable flashlight during your pre-flight inspection. You should also have a second, smaller flashlight in the cabin for reading or for use in the event of an in-flight electrical malfunction. As you conduct your pre-flight inspection, avoid shining the flashlight directly into your eyes. This could destroy your night vision, requiring you to readapt your eyes to the dark. Part of your night pre-flight inspection should include a check of all aircraft lighting. Besides assuring that the anti-collision lights are working, you must check your position lights, which are required by regulation for any operation between official sunset and sunrise. These lights help other pilots identify your direction of travel. When doing this, it's a good idea to tap the lens of the light to check for any loose connections. If the light blinks when tapped, the light should be fixed prior to departure. Although landing lights are not required unless the aircraft is operated for hire, most airplanes are equipped with one, and it should also be inspected. You should also check cabin lighting during your pre-flight to make sure the instrument panel is clearly visible. Once you have completed your visual inspection, it's wise to check the ramp area for hazards. Things such as tie-down ropes, chocks, and step ladders are more difficult to see at night, and a quick check of the surrounding ramp area could prevent a mishap during taxi. Before starting the aircraft, take some time to thoroughly familiarize yourself with the location of all instruments, controls, and switches. Fumbling for them in the dark can be confusing and dangerous. While cockpit organization is important at all times, it's especially important at night. Knowing where everything is located will make it easier to find your computer, sectional, or even a pencil. One way to keep from losing essential items in the dark is to use a clipboard or map board to fasten charts, navigation logs, and other essentials in a known location. As an additional aid, be sure your sectional is open to the proper panel and your route of flight is clearly visible. During an engine start at night, use extra caution. In addition to the normal call out of clear, Turning on the position lights or momentarily flashing other aircraft lights will alert others in the area. Before taxiing, especially at an unfamiliar airport, you might want to request taxi instructions. Then when ready to taxi, turn on the taxi or landing light. Because taxi lights do not cast very wide beams and illumination to either side of the aircraft is limited, Taxi speeds should be slower at night. When approaching another aircraft, be courteous and turn the landing light off. 
if safety permits. This will avoid temporarily blinding the oncoming pilot. As you're taxiing, if there is ever any doubt about where you are or how to get somewhere, don't hesitate to ask. It's also important to remember that when you receive a runway holding or hold short instruction, you must read it back to the controller. Answering with your call sign or Roger is not acceptable. Before taking off, it's important that you conduct a thorough run-up. Since it's not as easy to detect an unintentional forward movement at night as it is during the day, it's a good idea to use the parking brake. By carefully completing all of the items on the checklist, you can detect potential problems which might arise. Before taxiing onto an active runway for takeoff, you should carefully check the final approach course for aircraft. At non-tower airports, it is recommended that you do a slow 360 degree turn in the same direction as the flow of air traffic while closely searching for other aircraft in the vicinity. After ensuring that the final approach and runway are clear of other traffic, you are ready to taxi onto the runway for takeoff. It's important to note that during night operations, ATC will not issue a clearance to taxi into position and hold for intersection departures. During a night takeoff, the runway center line and runway lights provide visual references for directional control. As you begin the takeoff roll, maintain directional control by selecting a reference point down the runway, such as the point where the runway lights appear to converge. Having fewer reference points at night can make it more difficult to establish the proper climb attitude, especially over sparsely populated areas. Therefore, you should use your flight instruments to help establish the proper attitude. As you gain altitude, more distant highways, cities, and lighted areas may become visible. On a clear, moonlit night, it may be possible to determine the outline of terrain and other surface features. Flying at higher altitudes at night will increase your visibility for pilotage, radio navigational reception, and gliding distance. However, you need to consider the existing weather and oxygen requirements at these altitudes. Scanning at night is another important consideration. Although an aircraft's position lights enhance the see and be seen concept, you must not become complacent when scanning for traffic. Unless a conscious effort is made to separate an aircraft's lights from stars or the lights of a city, conflicting traffic can go unnoticed. One way you can help other pilots to see your aircraft is by turning on your landing light. In fact, the FAA is encouraging all pilots to turn on their landing lights when operating within 10 miles of any airport, regardless of the time of day. Another thing that can be very difficult to detect at night is changing weather conditions and cloud formations. Typically, the first indication of flying into marginal weather conditions is a disappearance of stars or lights on the ground. A halo or luminous glow around the position lights or a reflection of the landing and anti-collision lights may indicate you have penetrated an area of haze or clouds. If you inadvertently enter these conditions, you should immediately use instrument references to establish control of the airplane in straight and level flight. Then note your present heading and make a 180 degree turn back to visual conditions. To help avoid accidentally flying into instrument weather, you should continually update your weather briefing by contacting en route flight advisory service or any flight service station along your route. Your concern for changing weather conditions should be combined with careful planning for emergencies. If you need to make a forced landing, finding a suitable field presents special problems. The nature of the surface and terrain is difficult to see, even on a bright moonlit night. In the event of an engine failure at night, one of your primary considerations should be to plan an approach and landing to an unlighted area. Lighted areas typically indicate structures that may obstruct a landing area. Although highways may provide places to land, 
you need to be aware of the possibility of power lines that are often located along and across them. As a safety precaution, many pilots alter their route at night to keep within a reasonable distance of lighted airports for most of the flight. When planning for an emergency landing at night, one of the primary considerations should include selecting a landing area close to public access if possible. When approaching an airport at night, it may be difficult to identify the runway layout until you are almost on top of the airport. For this reason, you should fly toward the airport beacon light until the lights outlining the runway are distinguishable. To fly a traffic pattern of the proper size and direction, the runway threshold and runway edge lights must be positively identified. Once seen, the approach threshold lights should be kept in sight throughout the airport traffic pattern and approach. To conclude your flight, the same landing procedures and techniques used during the day are also performed at night. However, runway lights, airport lights, city lights, and the airplane's landing light may create illusions not encountered during daylight. Thus, speed, altitude, and distances may be more difficult to judge. If glide slope information, such as Avasi or Pappy, is available, it will help you maintain the proper descent attitude. By carefully monitoring your flight instruments and power setting, you can help to ensure a smooth approach and landing. You should practice night landings both with and without the landing light to enable you to make a safe landing in case the light fails. Although special consideration is needed at night, proper preparation and flying techniques will help to make flying at night a very enjoyable experience. Your ability to go from daylight to the night environment 